Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 324 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. We're doing it. <laughs> Old Man River. <laughs> oh, that would be even lower. <laughs> On the Crier Media Network. Yeah, it sounds like you need to adjust the pitch on your turntable. <laughs> ah, today recording day is Friday. Toes going first day. Ah. Yeah, that's, that's where I was going. I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> February twenty third, twenty twenty four. And it's going to be a nice day here at the Beaver Lodge, although there's a little bit of fog this morning, actually. Yeah, I don't, I don't Fog in the winter is kind of interesting. Yeah. When you look out the door and there's like a little bit of snow on the ground and you still see fog, it's, yeah. I don't know. For some reason, those don't actually go together for me, it, but I know it can happen. It, it, it does happen from time to time, but it's kind of, str- it's a strange weather phenomenon, kind of like when we get the sun dogs, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver. I was going to say the Daily Beaver, <laughs> the Eager Beaver. Pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? And with me, as always, as you can hear, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss v Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. We have our usual Friday extended edition for you. So not just a nibble, but a full bite. Beaver. I do have to go into the office, but it's not until the afternoon. So yeah, we we, we can still do a full full uh, a full Friday. Oh, that reminds Excellent. me. I gotta I gotta ship out. A, I gotta send out something here. Uh, there's a we're gonna um, we may have somebody joining us later. Oh okay. And before we do anything else, let's ask Mr. Grizzly. Although I'm not sure if I can should do that when he is. Uh, Multitasking, no, but <laughs> ask him how your mental health is doing, sir. You know, all things considered, if I was any better, I would be a twin. Uh, yeah, no, feeling great. Uh, a little tired, but uh, I was up late last night watching, uh, we were watching music videos. Oh, nice. Yeah, oftentimes uh, Bridget and I will just, uh, you know dial up the YouTube music and just pull up music videos and I'll be showing her music that I love. And she's like, play this one next. And, you know, we'll go back and forth. So it's kind of like a DJ thing, if you will. But uh, yeah, just sharing music mm-hmm. with one another. And she introduced me to a new, uh, a, a new artist uh, discovered by, well, I don't know who discovered her actually, uh, but Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys produced and promoted her on his record label. And her name is, okay. I want to say, Britta. And she's got a track out, a single. And we watched the video last night. It's like, oh, man, it's 
sort of country, sort of Americana, sort of down homish. Um, I'll see if I can find it and provide a link to it. We obviously can't play it, but but uh, well worth well worth your time. Britta, cool, cool, cool. uh, Britta, oh, where is it? Uh, I'm gonna have to. Oh, wait, is that the video? Now I'll have to find it. I'll, I'll take a look for it a little bit later. All right. Um, speaking of something with a, a little bit of a country vibe, uh, did you hear uh, Beyonce's new song? Yeah. And have you heard the uh, idiots losing their shit over that? <laughs> yep. Well, they lost their shit the same way they lost their shit uh, over Old Town Road, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's not. Oh, what a great country song. Wait a minute. The guy singing is black. That's not country. Except who invented country music? Wasn't white people. Yeah, we got, but it's like, but little Nas X did something like really smart afterwards. He went and got himself Billy Ray Cyrus and then re recorded yeah. it again and then got it on country. <laughs> then made it the longest running number one hit in Billboard chart history. Yeah. All time. Yeah. Yeah. All time. Well, Beyonce, because she revealed during the Super Bowl, of course, because what better time to do it, that uh, she was going to release these two songs. And I don't know. I went to go listen to the song Texas Hold'em. And apparently it was the same thing. There was one radio station that said, you know, we're not going to play it in the United States because, you know, well, we play country music. And then they turned around and listened to it and says, oh, my God, this really is country. And after getting, you know, an earful <laughs> from people. Uh, and I didn't know, but many years ago, Beyonce had actually performed at the Country Music Awards with the Dixie Chicks. So, you know, when you go down the rabbit hole and you start looking at it. Um, but I really liked the song. And, uh, you know, on YouTube and TikTok and whatnot, you see all these people doing these dance things. Well, a lot of people are doing dances to it. A lot of white people. Yes. Who are into country with a cowboy hat and boots and, you know, and doing some pretty amazing stuff. So it doesn't seem that the public has a problem with it. Funny how that it just seemed that radio stations did. And uh, it seems that there's an actual... Canadian connection to that song because it was co-written by Calgary's Elizabeth Lowell Boland, better known as palm tree singer Lowell. You want to know another Calgary tie-in? Okay. The guitar that Tracy Chapman played when mm -hmm. she performed Fast Car during the Grammys with Luke Combs. Yeah, the mm -hmm. guitar was made in Calgary by a Calgary luthier. There you go. And it seems that it... Uh, um, how do I put it? Uh, I lost my thought. It happens. Britty is the name of the artist, and I put a link to it in the chat for those who okay, want to perfect. check it out, and I will send you the link as well, sir, in the, in the uh, chat here. Yeah, because I don't know that yeah. one. It's called uh, and, uh, Keep Running, and it's, it's a funky little video. It's real simple. It's only 3 minutes and 13 seconds, so it's not, you know, it's not a long video. It's real simple. It's one camera, few people, Country Road, give it a watch. I think I think right. you'll enjoy it. it. And it was uh, Bridget who showed me this last night. She turned me on to it. And I'm like, okay, I want to know more. So then, then we started going down that rabbit hole. And I go, oh, do you know who Mickey Guyton is? She goes, no. So I, I brought up the video of Black Like Me from the Grammy Awards from during, you know, a couple of years ago during the pandemic. And she was like, oh, my God. Yeah, at the end, we're both in tears. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, nice. Love Mickey Guyton. And it seemed, yeah. And it seems that uh, Megan Bulow performs just as Bulow. Uh, you might remember her if people don't know the name off the top of the head. There was a song called Not a Love Song that was a hit a few years mm -hmm. ago. We won a Juno Award for it. Apparently, she wrote on the track. And then Nathan Ferraro of the Ontario alt pop band, The Midway State, is also credited as a songwriter on that song. So it's very country, but it's Canadian country. Kick ass. And then. And then you had some people like getting really, really, really upset about it. And it's like, um, and there were like people from, you know, country artists, some of them even from other parts of the country, the United States. And it's like, um, did you all forget that Beyonce was born in Texas? Yeah, she's a, she's a girl from the South. <laughs> no, no, no. She's, she's from New York city. No, she is not. 
No, she is not. She is a country gal, which is why she uh, was, well, the chicks, because they don't go by Dixie Chicks anymore, but why she was, right. you know, happy to perform with them. They're all Texans. Yeah. It's like, it's like she should be singing. She's got more right than sing country. She's like full on Texas. She's from the country. <laughs> but yeah, I like that song. Yeah, I heard it the I other like day, it and, and somebody it's good. Somebody did something that was really cool. They took a clip from Newsies when I don't know if you remember. Oh, and yes. they're all dancing like it's sort of a line dance because it's a musical number. They're all paper boys, I guess, or, or paper carriers right. or whatever. Let's, let's not get carried away with uh, gender terminology when it comes to people who delivered the paper in the 1920s. Okay. <sighs> had to get that out of the way but i watched the video and it was like it matches up perfectly it's freaky i also saw another video where it was like a lawrence welk dance number and they were playing yes. metallica and it yes you've seen that one i'm like yes but and somebody says how does that work and i go because it's rhythm it's the same rhythm yes. it's the four four beat it's the same rhythm. that's all it's music you can you can dance to anything <laughs> yeah yep did you have since we're talking about music, did you uh, check out the, the two uh, Tate McRae videos that I sent you? When did you send them to me? Oh, my God. Uh, like, soon after we talked about them, I, we talked about her you know, when the Juno Awards came out. I, Nominations. You'll so. have to resend them to me because I don't think I had a chance to check them out. Okay. Because I, I sent you the, the, the video for Greedy because I said, you know, never has hockey seemed so <laughs> steamy. She actually, uh, it, like, it's a, pure dance jam okay because by that point it's all set in the hockey arena so you know the place where you go get your skates yeah, and then right, behind yeah. the boards whatnot and then there's one of the times where she's got like this like sort of like crop t-shirt whatnot where you can sort of see some of like the bra underneath it like this and she's got the hockey glove on one hand and she's like <laughs> I do <didn't laughs> remember you telling me thinking, about that. i'm thinking damn it's like hockey got hot all of a sudden and then uh, there's the other one i i sent you it's a song called uh feel like shit which is a good song on its own but I, I sent it to you because i said that she was the first canadian and so you think he can dance and in that one it's a pure pure um lyrical dance video sort of like when pink did um uh her performance of try at uh, the grammys or the american music awards right when she did a whole lyrical yeah. dance number mm -hmm. with, with a guy because as she was singing well this is a video like that and you can see you just like her her leg goes up there and twists around and all that kind of stuff and it's just like damn that girl can dance she can really dance because in a lot of the videos a lot of people go oh it, you know it's just hairography right you just swing your head you have long hair you swear and like this and you go ah, you know but it's like no no she 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 can really dance she can contort and twist her body and uh, almost acro dancing in some ways too like she's she's real good <laughs> yeah it's like because i mean i used to dance in game you know recognize his game and it's like yeah i've been watching her body and goes like yeah my body never did that <laughs> my body can just never ever ever came any anywhere close to doing <laughs> what hers did <laughs> that's when it, you know you watch a video like that sense in which you realize it's like yeah I, I thought I was good and I was good enough to get to dance school. I was good enough to get into a bachelor of fine arts even, but yeah, I was, um, yeah, I don't think I ever would have made the national arts center stage <laughs> when I, when I see people move that way, it's like, yeah, that my body did not bend and twist in that way at all. You're familiar with <laughs> Edward Locke and his work? La yes. La, la, yes la, human la, steps. Human steps. Well, they're the ones, they're the whole reason. I really, really got into it seriously. Cause they're the company I wanted to dance. Dude, for. the first time I saw them perform, I'm like, I didn't know humans could do that. And I mean that yeah. sincerely. I was, my mind was blown away. So I, yeah. I did get to see them perform at the NAC with Louise Le Calvier, who was, yes, uh, she had long blonde dreads and is yes. shredded. Shre I yes. would like to be that fit. <laughs> she was in the movie Stranger Things, uh, Strange Days. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Angela yeah. Bassett. Yeah. She, well, she, um, that she, I think she's still performing, but don't quote me on that. I haven't, I, I, the last time I saw La 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 Human Steps was over 30 years ago. And yeah. they were, uh, it was, uh, oh, I still have the, the, the promo poster for it. And it was really cool. Like the last number was just Louise Le Cavalier and, a, and another dude who was, I don't know, he's a prop dude, I guess. <laughs> and, and the guy came up with this, uh, 
Roland guitar, which has it was a strange Roland guitar, it had a separate bar, like a giant handle on it. Anyway, he was playing crunchy metal power chords and he was leaning yep. into them. And he was really close while they were making the craziest dance moves I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, soon after oh, that, yeah. I think a year or two after that, uh, is when uh, Cirque du Soleil started to, to become nationally known. And they were featured yep. on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And it kind of took off yep. from there. Because again, what Cirque did and what La 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 Human Steps did, we'd never seen human beings do that before. No, no, no. Yeah, it, it was a big deal when they came up. And then we had like other groups like Carbon 14, uh, which was go really good. And then in, um, in Washington, Connecticut, there was another group called Momix. Uh, so there, there was an era in the in the early '80s where like lyrical and contemporary dance was literally all over the place, and like these, these are you know all the all the groups you know I, I would have loved the companies I would have loved to join, and uh, you know and and then in the, in the United States there were two other companies there was the Dance Theater of Harlem and the Alvin Ailey Group, which are just whatever they do so you know wherever you are in canada if you hear like alvin ailey is coming to town uh or you know i'm not sure if la 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 human steps does anything anymore um but go check them out because it's how would i put it dancers they're athletes mm, well here, here look here's a here's a case in point this is uh, this is from uh eight years ago that's Louise Le Calvier. She's 53 in that photo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, oh my so God. It's, <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things, right? You know, the, the torque and the jumps and the leaps and what, you know, it's, it, they're, they literally are athletes. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. But I also always know, I guess, Whatever talent show you're in, you could be the freaking most amazing dancer and you will always lose to the cute seven-year-old girl singing somewhere out there. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter how talented you are. It's like people, I think people don't under, understand, you know, they could understand musical talent or singing talent because everybody tries to sing at some point or another and they go oh, well, i can't sing or wow they sing very well but not everybody tries to dance like that so there's a little less of an appreciation of it so um yeah i have a i have a well of course because i was a dancer myself but i have a mad respect for dancers because also typically the careers are very short it's yes. pretty rare to be 53 and still dancing well she's a lot, 65 of, a lot of dancers now and still yeah. performing I just put yeah, a link to a lot her of, website, louiselecavalier.com. It'll just I, check it out when you can. It'll blow your mind. I remember when I was in dance school, there was um, uh, um, Canadian, uh, I think it was the, the, the Canadian version of Time magazine, had um, a magazine about, uh, an, uh, um, oh yeah, not a magazine, an, an issue about careers like this and you know, professionals and how they were paid. And it's like, and if all the professionals, dancers were the lowest paid oh yeah and considering what they put their body through and all you have to do is like twist one ankle bust one knee and your career's over a lot of dancers careers are over before they start i have some fear and it's from a uk tv documentary we might be able to show a little bit we might get hit with a copyright but i can take it down later but i want people to see this this is the i was talking about uh this is from about 30 years ago and when you see this, if you've never seen it before, your, your jaw is going to drop is all I can say, because it's three minutes and 27 seconds. We'll watch about a minute of it because I'm trying to avoid the copyright hit. Right. But have a look at this. It's going to blow your mind. Oh, I got, hang on. Let me restart it with the music because you want to hear it. demonstrate the range of the tube and its willingness to give new talent a break, let's enjoy an extraordinarily arty moment from performance artist La La Human Steps. And then a local band from the northeast called Prefab Sprout, with singer-songwriter 
Paddy McAloo. Yeah. Um, for the people who are going to be listening on the podcast version, um, yeah, that may have sounded a little weird yeah, to you. Yeah, probably a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to edit that section out. Yeah. But uh but that thing where they did where they were jumping sort of like and they're you know vertical in the air mm -hmm. and not vertical and well, not vertical, horizontal mm -hmm. in the air and and spinning like that. When I saw that, it was like them, them, they're the ones I want to dance mm -hmm. for. Them. Because that was the stuff I could do. Right? I couldn't bring my leg and put it up in a full developé. My legs would not do no, that. But you can do this athletic stuff that they do. But yes, I was very, exactly. I was bottom heavy and I had huge legs and I had lots of height when I jumped. And, you know, that was the stuff I could do. You know, I, I wasn't, um, how, you could, how, could, how could you put it? All the dance I had seen up until that point had always been graceful and delicate. I'd never seen anything actually. so athletic. Yeah so athletic and that you know just jumping into mm -hmm. each other and it's like like that i can do mm -hmm. that's the stuff i can do i can hit it hard that way yes i also developed some grace but you know again when all you can do is lift your leg to about 90 degrees and then you have people that can lift it all the way up you know there's so much more graceful things that you can do and you always like the things that other people have that you don't oh yeah you know? but then i noticed when i went to dance school you know when people were were running into running into us and i was like you know they would run and then they get close to you and then they stop their momentum and then jump and it's like no it's like use that moment and jump because i need that to catch you and yes i will go back like this and i will spin you and stuff like that but you need to give me the momentum and there was a lot of, especially the the people that came from ballet straight ballet and then moved into lyrical because we're always afraid of like just like no, no, slam your body into me mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right don't be don't be afraid so yeah, I love it. I love it very, very, very much. And dancing is dancing is my life. I have, I have the soul of a dancer. So it's just well, <laughs> there, here's, there's an interview. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the chat if, if anybody's interested. Because you know this is uh, Louise de Cavier being interviewed by CBC Arts. This is from seven years ago, and in this interview, she's talking about dancing with David Bowie because she toured with David Bowie on the Glass yes. Spider tour. She was in his video Fame yep. in the 90s as well. That's right, because he saw her perform and was blown. I mean, David Bowie was a theatrical artist, right? He was right. an artist in every sense of the word. And when he saw them perform, it blew his mind like it did mine when I saw them the first time. And he had her, hired her and she toured with him for like, I think, a year or two years. And the Glass Spider Tour was a massive tour for Bowie. Massive. If you're not massive. familiar with it, his, you know who his guitar player was at the time? Mm, no. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh my word! Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, he, Bowie didn't okay. cheap out. <laughs> Stevie Ray Vaughan can fill venues in his own yeah. right. Well, and and completely different style of music, but he wanted right. the best. He hired the best, and gave you a performance. So yeah, check those links out if you if you want if you're interested at all. Okay, let's let's uh, let's let's move it along because we've been we've been going along here for a bit. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're today we were we started with some a little culture. Yes, yeah, a little, a little yeah. culture. Yeah. I like that. Well, I like know. that. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, let's see. What do we want to start? I had there's, something. There's so much to deal with right now. It's, there's some it's, it's, kind Oh, my God. But, well, look, do we go back to the trough that is Pierre Polyev? And uh, it's, I mean, the guy just lies and lies and lies. And he lies so much. I don't even think he knows what the truth is anymore. Mm. I mean, there's an article here. Um uh, where was I? Oh, I lost it. There was an article talking about how many lies he he said this week. <laughs> I think this is uh, the week he's lied the most the entire time he's been in politics. Well, it's also the week he's been in front of the media most. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting how he's uh, gone from night to day. 
Like you wouldn't find him. I mean, he went like after the synagogue thing, he disappeared for like, I think it was 58 days or 56 days. And the last week and a half or so, or two weeks, especially since things have been going terribly for him with the, you know, he would not answer and wanting, not wanting to answer the questions about trans stuff. And now he can't shut up about it. <laughs> it seems. Uh, and uh, as a, uh, who was it here in the chat this morning? said i saw theo's latest cartoon oh i'm looking at her down so uh, glass spider tour peter frampton toured with him it was the record that they were touring under that stevie ray vaughn played on stevie didn't tour with him stevie played on the record for the re for the record <laughs> okay there Sorry, i just wanted to answer um, a question there no 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 worries no worries uh Oh, darn, I wish I could remember who, which kit brought it to our attention. I'm sorry, I, I'm scrolling down in the chat and I can't find it because I wanted to give you credit. Um, but Mr. Grizzly, mm -hmm. since we're talking about uh, PR for a second, I don't want to talk about him too much. No, so no, no, too much no, no, no. Um, yes, uh, but yeah. actually I have it. I have it here. I have that okay. right here. From Theo Mudakis. The Conservative Party is focused on what's most important to Canadians. Pierre Polyev in a security guard t-shirt, uh, security guard shirt and tie, standing in front of a uh, um, men's and women's toilet, uh, holding up his hand towards uh, an ambiguous, an androgynous, androgynous individual. Show me your papers. <laughs> and seriously, yeah, yeah. So this guy has gone from housing mm -hmm. and inflation. To genital inspection. To genital inspection and digital ID. Yes, yeah. I'm going to give you more freedom, but if you want to watch porn, you got to scan your digital ID. Excuse me, what? Sorry, what? How? Now, somebody, uh, somebody uh, made a comment yesterday, and I don't know if you had a chance to see it, about how they um, had a porn addiction at a very young age and, and wants to yes. see it wiped from the planet. And I'm like, and I understand, and I empathize, and I'm sorry you went through that, because that must have been hellacious. Yes. And I get, I get where you're coming from, but if we're going to live in a free society, we have to understand there are going to be things that people want access to that we don't necessarily like, but if they fall within legal parameters, I don't think we should be stopping people from doing that. Yeah. And here's the thing, right? It's, you know, and you hear the other part of the arguments like, well, you know, porn is everywhere. You know, government needs to do something, and there are certain things that government need to do. And then we're almost—it's almost like the the sex ed stuff. And again, right? You know, it's like all the people that keep on complaining that the government is the nanny state, right? Want the government to be a nanny state when it comes to some things, some of these things. And once again, it's one of these things where they keep on using, oh, but think of the children as the back door to other stuff so for example i'm old enough to remember back in the day for fights for gay rights mm -hmm. when we're talking about same-sex marriage and we're talking about same-sex adoption oh but a child is much better in a nuclear family with a mom and a dad okay maybe maybe not we don't know mm -hmm. because it's not like there are tons of studies of children of same sex parents at the day that you know that, that were done that people can rely on. It's like, but we live in a world where half of marriages end up in divorce. Like not everybody is a mom and dad family. True. So if everybody was a mom and dad family and they stayed together forever and whatnot, I could see maybe your point, but that's not the reality we live in. So never has been. Why never has been the reality. So yeah. Never. But why couldn't a single parent who's gay raise a child just as well as a single parent who is not gay? Why couldn't a loving gay household raise a child just as well as anyone else? And it was like, oh, think of the children, you know. Why don't you ask Dave Bautista about think of the children? Dave Bautista's mother is a lesbian, has mm -hmm. been married to a woman while been with the same partner for decades. Um, Dave ba Bautista is like a six foot four, 280 pound manly manly man mm. not gay so well th that was the other argument yeah. too it's like oh they'll, they'll turn your child and gay it's really, yeah. really because both my parents were heterosexual and i started to like then why didn't i end up 
heterosexual. Right. So, and then the, these, yeah, well, it's, the, well how, let's go, with, let's run with that for a second. Okay. Uh, they'll turn your child gay. So if two heterosexual parents have a gay child, did they turn the child gay? Like, where's the logic in any of their statement is what I'm getting at. There's none. It makes no damn sense. You're born yeah, that way. Like, you know, we, we kept on saying this, like, you know, straight people have a problem with gay. Stop, if, stop making know, them. Stop making us. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 100% of <laughs> there was a time. Well, no, actually, it wasn't. I was going to say there was a time where 100% of gay children in the world were made by heterosexual parents, but that's not actually true because there's a lot of people that, you know, back in the day, oh, my God, I might be gay. Get me to the church on time. Um, need to repress that stuff. Um, so, and then we're talking about this trans stuff. And again, it's like, oh, think of the children. They're too young to make those decisions. And yes. GSA is back in the day. Oh, think of the children they're going to be exposed to. And then the book, Heather Has Two Mommies. Oh, think of the children they're going to, right? It's always think of the children, which then creates the precedent like we saw with the trance stuff of yes let's insert let's let us the small government people to get government out of your life insert government directly into the doctor patient relationship like let's support parental rights okay because of the children so yes let's insert the government into the parenting of an actual loving mm -hmm. parent of a transgender child who wants to make a medical decision that the right doesn't approve of and, and can't make that medical decision until they're at least 18 by the way by yes. the way well, that decision but there are other ones yes. that oh, yeah. gender block, uh, puberty blockers and, and you know but but let's insert ourselves mm -hmm. there well that's the funny thing in right? Alberta I think a abortion they talk about that's like think of the children that are not born so let's yeah. insert ourselves there in Alabama the IVF thing yeah. it's like embryos are now people, people for some reason like this and you know and if you ever it's going so far as like if you're going to have one you can only have one implanted mm -hmm. at the time it's like we know that they don't just implant one embryo it's like, no just one at a time and if it doesn't work because you know every sperm is sacred um <laughs> Yeah, but but it's like every embryo is a child, but they're not outruling masturbation for men, are yeah. they? Yeah, see, that's the other thing, right? Because that, that is the other side of that coin. So if an embryo is seen as a human being, shouldn't an ejaculation be seen the same way? Didn't you just kill millions of babies? Like, I mean, really, yeah. if... if if they're going to if they're going to legislate women's bodies in that manner, you know, you got to go both ways on that, guys. Sorry. Yep. So, but it's always we always use protection of children as the back door to do this, and that's the same thing with this. You know, it's not that the government doesn't believe that there can be harms on the internet, and frankly, you know, I understand that porn's a big thing, but frankly. I'm more concerned with just general social media and what it does to kids more than I am with porn, to be totally honest. Like this, but yes, we should do our best to try and not expose kids to porn. But it's like, I don't know about anybody else, but my first exposure to porn came in the home. It's usually where it is. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like you find your uncle or your big brother's porn stash. Mm -hmm. yeah. I found I found my foster parents' video stash one day. Oh, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> one day when I was old enough to be left alone at home, Ugh. went under the TV like this. They thought they were there. They thought they were in the cabinet, and nobody was. And I slipped one in, and it's like, ooh, hello. <laughs> What's this? One one of the things <laughs> I hear constantly, and I'm sure you've heard it too. And it, it often comes from religious right. That's somebody's daughter. Yes, yes, it is. That's also somebody's son. That's where I was going. That's also somebody's son, but nobody ever makes that argument. Here's something else to consider. If we want to talk equality in this world, if you're a man working in that field, you are way underpaid. Hetero porn, men make nothing. I like nothing. Yep. They are mere props. 
That's it. The only way a man makes money in that is if he owns the distribution rights, the production company, all of that. Otherwise, if he's just a paid performer, he makes nothing. Then that's true. And this is a well-known fact. It's not a secret. Now, if a man wants to make money in porn, he does gay for pay, which happens a lot, a lot, like a lot. And I'm like, a lot. It's shocking. I watched a documentary on it a few years ago and it was an interesting doc. There was a scene where they were in uh, Aspen and the guy, you know, they're showing the setup. They didn't show any of what was filmed. They show the setup in this and he does the scene. And then later on, he's on the top of the mountain getting ready to do a run. And he goes, so how are you with all this? And he goes, what? I just made $8,000 for an hour's work. What do I care? I'm like, I, I, I guess, uh, sorry. It's not something I could ever do. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. it just you know but i mean free to choose but i'm, yes. I'm sitting oh, yeah. there and I'm, mm -hmm. but i'm sitting there and i'm watching like if in the 70s and in the 80s when porn wasn't as accessible as it is now mm. and we still you yeah. could still access porn yeah. you know but back when you had to like when it, when it was in a, when it wasn't like shrink wrap and on the top rack of the magazines at the store and when you went to the video store and you had to go through the curtains the curtain. yeah the beaded curtain yeah like this and you were still exposed to porn. Like, what do you really expect the government to be able to do? Yeah. Now that it's everywhere, really, like this. But hey, let's give you a digital ID. Let's have you know. And I mean, what are you going to do? Like, you're going to show who in their right mind? I mean, if you ask me, do I want to show my personal identification numbers and stuff like that to a porn company? Oh no. No. Nope. Uh, no. And here's something Thank else you to very consider. Much. It's like, okay, now that that private company has it and it did it through a government ent entity, did they just create a file on you so that they can track your your twisted, sick mind? Well, that's the other thing. Right? Is You're that... now in a category. You're now being <laughs> labeled. Well, number one, would I trust a porn company with my personal data and information? No. How do I prove online, right? You know, they say you need ID to go buy alcohol and drugs. Yeah, but there's a material difference between going into a store yes. and showing a piece, of, a piece of plastic that has limited information mm -hmm. on it to prove and buy something. How do you do that online? You know, you just like put your like thing in front of the camera and say, <laughs> like, how do you do that online? So if it has to have piece have to come with some type of of digital ID of some type. And I'm thinking, well, in the recent federal court decision mm -hmm. on the Emergencies Act, Justice Mosley ruled that the banks giving information to the police was unconstitutional based on seizure laws, not because the assets, the money, was frozen because there are no property rights in the constitution, but because of your data on your credit card statement, it shows everything you bought everywhere. So it gives information about your lifestyle choices, what you consume or not. That information mm -hmm. was seized. Yeah. So we create a digital ID and we, we can consider the number of security breaches. We create a system by which somehow, some way, someone will find a back door to all your information? Really? Is this what we're proposing? And these are, this is like the anti-gatekeeper people, allegedly, saying, oh, no, no, we need to put some gates here, we need to put some gates here, and let's, let, let's again, in the name of the children, create a digital ID, which a lot of people will turn around and go, yeah, 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 let's do that, let's do that, let's do that. And then once you create that digital ID, well, gee, what else can we use that for? That's And it's the conservatives themselves who've been telling us, no to digital ID. Pierre Polyev spent, you know, in his anti-WEF stuff like this, an anti-15-minute city and all that kind of stuff. No, no, no digital ID. You can't trust the government. You can't trust the government. And it's like, oh, but when it comes to accessing porn, oh, you dirty little perverts. Mm. Yeah, we need a digital ID on you. It's like, I'm sorry. But I cannot imagine a bigger boner killer than imagining Pierre Polyev over my shoulder. Or uh, no, I'm sure this will be the guy they'll they'll assign to to uh, verify that stuff. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs>
Blah. Yes. And then here's the really wild thing. According to Press Progress, conservative MP Garnet Genuous, yeah. he of the yeah, let's keep conversion therapy illegal a little bit longer. Mm. Legal. Which is literally torture of children. Yes. They had to ship them off to Latvia mm -hmm. when they had the vote. Look, I was no fan of... <laughs> Aaron O'Toole mm -hmm. shipped him off. I was no fan of Aaron O'Toole, but I respect him on that one because he knew it yeah. was the right thing to do. He knew it was the yeah. right thing to do. So let's get this yeah. guy out of the picture so we can put an end to this. Yes, and he shipped him off to Latvia with a chaperone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another member of the Conservative Party, I guess, to go look at something having to do with our UN stuff or NATO stuff in Latvia. And while they were there, they slipped it in. And Genuous was really pissed off about that. Mm -hmm. But Garnet Genuous, who wants conversion therapy, to continue, says he trusts porn companies won't leak names or viewing histories of Canadians who visit porn websites. Uh -huh. Again. The same mm. porn companies for which they want digital ID and for which Pornhub in particular had been sued because, you know, there was some questionable content with regard to age mm -hmm. yeah. and certain activities that seemed a little more violent. Um, so we don't trust their content, but we trust porn sites to not leak names of you and history. We don't trust parents loving parents of transgender children to make medical decisions in the best interest of their children, but we trust porn sites won't leak names or viewing histories of... Really? It's, it's almost like they're trying to police your thoughts. I mean, it. I'm serious when I say that. It's like they're trying to police your thoughts. Because if they're going to track everything you do online, which is what they will do if you... If you, I don't know, you're, you're, you're depressed, you're down, you've had a rough day, your spouse has left you, your girlfriend broke up with you, your boyfriend broke up with you, whatever the case is, and you just want to escape for a little bit into some fantasy world, and you decide, okay, I'm going to look at this, look at this lovely shop thing in, in Ibiza on the beach and all these beautiful people and beautiful lighting, and I'm going to watch this. Next thing you know, you're on a list, and that list gets leaked. And all of a sudden, you're kicked off of the um, school board trustee or your local community center because you watched a video once. It, this is what can happen, yeah. okay? Yeah. Am, am I being alarmist? No, because I don't. It's not, nothing's going to come of this. I mean, nothing will come of this. No. Most Canadians would be like, hey, hang on a second. You're going too far here. Mm -hmm. Whether you... Whether you consume the product or not you're trying to police people's thoughts you cannot yeah. do that yeah so this is a bill uh, introduced in the senate bill s210 and um, garnet genuous uh, went to a place called tag tv tag tv and gave an interview and um, he said some people are critical for ideological reasons, and they say, well, if there's even a scintilla of a risk that there could be some privacy breach, then we shouldn't provide this protection. The way the bill works is that the companies are responsible for undertaking meaningful age verification, so the companies providing this have a responsibility to have meaningful mechanisms in place to verify the ages of those that are accessing sexual content. These are the same people that say, well, if there's even a scintilla of risk that there could be some privacy, privacy breach when it comes to digital ID, for example, to file your taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or to go, like I think it's Estonia in the United States that has a completely digital way of doing government that's super efficient. It's th that, th that we can't have. That's big government. But porn companies, sure, give them the information I trust. It's so wildly inconsistent you know that's it's so wildly inconsistent it really when you think about it you get right down to the ideology behind it it's like wait a minute let me see if i understand this you're telling me your your right-wing evangelical christian mind is telling me that i should trust company that you don't want to exist with my personal information <laughs> In what galaxy, dimension, solar system? Again, the absurdity. Planet, the absurdity of it all. Continent, country, area code, and postal code. Does this make sense? 
Not not a single it, it one. Just it doesn't. 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 Then he goes on to say, obviously those companies have an interest in protecting the privacy of people who provide that age verification. The concern is that, okay, if somebody has to provide age verification, does that mean that there's a risk their name will get out that they've been accessing this material? But the companies have an incentive to ensure protection for privacy. Yeah. And so do hospitals. Mm -hmm. and, guess what? and so do your utilities. Breaches happen. And how many times a year do we hear, hey, there's a breach, your personal information might have been leaked. Do you know how much... Uh... <laughs> You know how much hackers would want to get that info to use that as a blackmail? Yeah. Because they already do I mean, this, right? This already takes place. But if they have that information, I'm going to release to the world. You know, they. I'm sure you've seen and heard the stories about, oh, I, I've got you on camera doing something nasty. I'm going to give me $1,000 or I'm going to release it to the world. And they tried that on a friend. Sextortion. Yeah, sextortion. Thank you. They tried that on a friend of mine and she's like, that's my intellectual property. That's how I earn a living. It's not true, but that's how I earn a living. That's my intellectual property. You leak that, you have to pay me for it. And they're like, what? She goes, yeah, I'm going to sue you into oblivion. I, I, I make that product. I sell that product. You, you do that, I'm going to sue. They ran away from her very quickly. None of it was true. She didn't have anything of that nature. They were just trying to blackmail her, saying, we have this on you. And she's like, she knew damn well they didn't. But instead right. of saying, no, you don't, she just messed with their heads and they ran away screaming. Yeah. So should there be something to try? Should we be doing something to try and reduce access to porn children? Absolutely. I'm just not sure that a digital ID is it. Now, the liberals are considering a digital harms bill of some kind, which they'll probably have to tackle that in some other way. Um, but there are more digital harms than just porn. As we've seen, you know, all, all, all these young girls that are seeing things on the, on the web and, you know, starving themselves or, you know, comparing themselves and feeling like crap. And, you know, there's all that kind of stuff too. And sextortion, all those other things. So, you know, you have to go a little broader than just access to porn. Uh, of course, of course, we should be trying to do something. I mean, you don't just leave things as a wild west, but digital ID is definitely not it, you know, I don't know how you do age verification online in a way that's meaningful without handing too many too much too, too much private information. I know. I know. I'm Should not. I'm not that tech savvy. CRA. Just use your CRA account to watch pornography. But I mean, like, I'm not that tech savvy. I'm. I'm maybe some really intelligent people were better than this than I am. Right? Yeah, Ashley Madison all over again. Exactly. You know, are can figure that out. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm not saying that the technology is not there, right? But I don't want to trust my private information to a porn company. That's for sure. And I'm pretty sure many people don't want that either. Any more than I want my private medical history. Yeah. So Going to a for-profit company. <laughs> yeah. But I'm also sitting there and I'm, th and I'm thinking, you know, um, There seems to be a lot of stuff that parents want from the government in order to protect children. Yes. And I'm, I want to say this in a respectful way. It's like there are parents that love their kids yes, and are doing their best. And they know it's everywhere and they would like some help. And that is a completely legitimate feeling, right? But how you get there is another thing, right? And we shouldn't want, we shouldn't be so ready or eager or willing to surrender our basic and our fundamental privacy rights mm -hmm. in order to get a little bit of extra help. So while we may all agree while the overwhelming majority of Canadians, adults might agree that yes, it would be nice to have something and that we should try everything that we can to try and prevent children accessing porn at a very young age. Yes. Yes. There, but not at any cost and not at any price. Right? I'm going to be willing to vote for this government that's willing to do this and this and this and this 
just because it promised that it will protect my kids. You got to look at the whole agenda here mm -hmm. right? and you got to look at what are the advantages and what are the potential downsides of any policy that looks to be put in place. But there's also the segment of parents who want their child protected from that because they don't want them to know anything, anything about it. So like the same parents that say, Hey, I don't want sex ed taught in schools because it's my job to teach the kids okay. about it. But then they don't. Yeah. Yeah. And if the because was so good, you're ne the, the kid is never old enough or pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Because the kid is never old enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I was like, Oh no, you're still too young yet. You're 14. You're still too young yet. Like, As adults, we need to start realizing that our kids are involved sexually at younger ages. It's that simple. We have to get comfortable with talking sex to our kids when they are at a younger age. Because the worst thing of all is letting a kid go out into the world defenseless. Letting the kid go out into the world not knowing that they can say no. Letting a kid go out into the world, exactly, today more children are prematurely sexualized than any other time in the last 50 years. I'll take a, a well-known case, a well-known uh, story. Millie Bobby Brown. Is she even 18 years old yet? I remember when she show, she was on Stranger Things in the first season, and then when they came back for the second season, she had hit her growth spurt. And all of a sudden, Millie Bobby Brown is growing up in front of us. Oh, my God, look at... I'm like, she's 15. She's a child. Leave her alone. Stop sexualizing her. Yeah. I mean, pu puberty is happening earlier, too. Yeah. A lot earlier. Right? And all, and all that kind of stuff. So we can take the tech track them oh they're just too young we must shield the children from everything or we can equip them with the tools necessary for the world that they are the, what that they live in yeah. so we as adults need to become less squeamish and less uncomfortable talking about sex and one of the things when you talk about sex right when a kid comes to you at a young age and starts asking you about the birds and the bees right they don't need all of the gory details but what they react to, and they might not even understand all the details, but what they react to is your reaction. Mm -hmm. So if they act, ask you about sex and you start getting all weird about it, then they think, oh, sex is thing to be weird about, rather than sex is just a normal part of life. Like it or not. You may not be ready for it now. <laughs> like it or not. It's but it is a normal part of, part of life. It's a normal part and of life. And that was one of the things I loved about my mom. My mom... I was old enough to ask the question, I was old enough to get an age appropriate answer. Mm -hmm. She never ran away from it. Because when I asked how babies were made, she told me. She maybe gave me a little too much information. <laughs> but she told me, she just laid it all out for me. Right? We have to teach kids about healthy sexuality. You know your kids are going to come across porn, no matter what you do. You can, so maybe point. teaching them that porn is not real life, mm -hmm. right? Teach them that if somebody says, well, you have to because I bought you dinner, you're entitled to say no. Teach them about consent. Teach them about bad touch. It's not a teach transaction. Them, yes. Teach them, you know, it's a different way. Teach them about STDs. Teach them about pregnancy. Teach them about, right? teach them about harm reduction. Mm -hmm. Because even though you can tell your kids, no, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you should, some are still going to do it. We have to start accepting that people are going to do it anyway. People are going to be curious anyway, no matter how much we don't want them to be. So we shouldn't be living in the world we shouldn't be living in a world of should and should not. You should not be doing this at their age, so therefore I will not give you the information. It should be, I don't want you to do this at this age. I would not encourage you, 
but there is an odds, there's a chance that you might. So I want you to know this. And often by wanting to know it and knowing it, that will often delay people's interest because it's no longer, once you take away the mystery from it, for me, it was alcohol was the same thing because I grew up in a French Canadian family and at Christmas, we always had a glass of wine. Yeah. At six and seven, if the Montreal Canadians were in the Stanley Cup, I had a beer in my hand, one. Mm -hmm. beer. This. By the time I was 16, 17, 18, I wasn't the person that was like, oh my God, I can't wait until I turn 16, 18 because I can go in a bar and drink. Like this, I had already had alcohol and exposure to it and whatnot. And I've never been drunk a day in my life. Much like that. As a result. <clears throat> much like that with uh, European communities throughout France, right? Children, there's, yeah. there's lower uh, levels of alcoholism because they don't shield their children from it, from, you know, the cradle to damn near the grave. Yeah. So it's like, but the important part is we have to start focusing on teaching children about sex being normal, but there's a healthy way to approach sex and there are unhealthy ways. Yes, exactly. Kit Linda. Teach the kids about the good stuff, how about health, sexual relationships, fosters intimacy and well-being, enhances relationships, not just the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Everything in life has a good and a bad component to it. Everything can be a poison or a remedy, right? It's the dose that makes the difference. So it's, and it's difficult for parents, especially when it comes to things with sex, because, like some, my mom was still alive today. If she were, she'd be still, alive. I'd still be her baby. You always are her child. And I'm 50. Yeah. You're always her child, no matter what. No matter what. Right? So, yes, they are our babies. Mm -hmm. They're our precious little treasures. But don't leave them ill-equipped. Did someone say nudity? Ooh. <laughs> but it's like, just don't, don't leave them ill-equipped. Getting back to PP on this one, it's we're hitting a point now in the next two years because he's got about 19 months to go. Yes. Yes. Where he's not going to be able to beat the dead horse on inflation mm -hmm. because we're already between the two and three percent that the Bank of Canada said was their target range. We're at 2.9. I guess the core inf inflation without gas, though, still at 3.2. So we're at the high end of the range and they want closer to two, but we're in there. Yes. There's going to come a point where interest rates are going to go down a little bit. They probably won't go back down to zero or two or whatnot, but they might go down a little bit, another point, point and a half. The passport issue has been fixed. Long time ago. The travel issue has been fixed. So you can't beat that anymore. You got Sean Fraser going all over the country, killing it on housing. Yes. And he's got nothing else to offer than I'm going to punish cities and take money away from them. I don't know how that's going to help build housing at all. Um, all the issues that he's been beating, he's not going to have them. And he's still got 19 months of trying to make sure that the PPC wing, whose votes he really needs if he wants to be prime minister, doesn't slip away from him. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden... He's being Danielle's mini-me on parental rights and trans stuff. All of a sudden, he's obsessed with porn. All of a sudden, he's swallowing himself on digital ID. And I'm thinking, this digital ID and porn stuff like this, way to torch the incel vote that you've been courting for the last two years. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like, oh, that's not going to work in your favor, Skeppy. Do you think all those PPC types, like full libertarian or like the whose vote you want, are going to be, yeah, let's get on that. They'd yeah, like, I want to show my digital whoa. ID for porn. Yeah, especially with libertarians. Really? Yeah. So that's why I keep on saying time is not this guy's friend because he doesn't have enough content to fill 19 months. And if we're at, and I said that when he had it at 22, it's just three months later. And now he's not talking about stuff like inflation and health and whatnot. He's talking about porn and digital ID and trans stuff. 
he's going down that rabbit hole that's going to turn people off. Oh, yeah. As we do have a government, as imperfect as it is, that does seem to care about some of the issues. And they're taking action. So uh, I'm not sure what his long-term strategy on this is. And I mean, yes, it feeds some red meat to the base at the moment or to the part of the base. But he's losing. With this one, he's losing a big section of his base. Oh, massively. Right there. There's, there's a certain portion of the PPC vote that he's courting that just sort of went, wait, wait, what? Mm-hmm. You want to what? I'm not too sure. I'm not well, too sure that that's working for him. Here's a statement from Linda, which is mm, very real. I went to Catholic school in the 70s, so of course, no sex education. Half the girls I started high school with had dropped out because they got pregnant by the time I graduated. That was very common. And did you know, I don't, I don't know what the statistics are today, but in the late 70s and early 1980s, and I believe the 70s, uh, they called it the golden age of pornography. You can look yep. into that if you want. I think something like 85 or 90% of the women that were in pornography were from strict Catholic upbringings. This, this, I don't know what the stats are today, but that was at the time. It's because they were so repressed that when they you know, got out on their own in the world for the first time, they had this freedom that they never had before. So they expressed it in unique ways. I'm not making a judgment call there, by the way. I'm not throwing shade at anybody. I'm just giving you a statistic. Let's, let's move on here. I want to, I want to show you something I, here. Oh, okay. I go ahead. Have some things I want to present to, but go ahead. <laughs> So I was going to move it along uh, and discuss something, uh, the Alabama issue. And this, this is really disturbing. I'm going to put this thing on the screen and read it to you because this is really disturbing when you read this. The justice who ruled that embryos are children appeared on QAnon conspiracy oh, show. God, of course he did. Alabama Chief Justice Tom Parker indicated on the show he was a proponent of the Seven Mountains Mandate, an explicitly theocratic, theocratic doctrine at the heart of Christian nationalism. That is really bad. Okay, really I've bad. never heard of the Seven Mountains Mandate, so I'm going to... I think to it has to do that. with the Dominionists as well. The sort of... Yep. Yeah. Seven Mountain Mandate, it holds that there are seven aspects of society that believers seek to influence. Family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. Basically every aspect of your life. Yeah. They want to okay. hold dominion over you. Eee. Yeah. Ugh. Oh my God. Ugh. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> but that, that does not surprise me in the least. Into the brave home of the free. <laughs> yeah, really. Mm, not exactly. Yeah, sounds pretty judgy. There's something I want to bring uh, your attention to, Kits. It happened uh, the other day, mm -hmm. and um, the Prime Minister was in Alberta, and he went to make an announcement, some housing funding, I believe, in uh, Calgary, after making a huge housing announcement in British Columbia that they were going to... Remember when um, he went to Quebec mm -hmm. and said, I've got like X number of... Uh, millions or billions for for housing for you and the quebec premier said yeah the quebec premier was actually pressuring well pretending he was pressuring the prime minister because the prime minister was going to do it all along but about one week before the announcement was made you had quebec premier all over the news going like this and the federal government needs to let us know what it is they're doing with housing because you know we have a budget coming and we need to have that you know that dollar figure in there so we could prepare our budget because but the federal government i think went to quebec with 900 million and the federal government and the provincial government in quebec had 900 million dollars to match it well, in British Columbia the other day, the Prime Minister went there with, I think it is, $2 billion for the BC Builds program, which is being matched by the provincial government. Okay. And just dropped that money, uh, which was very nice. And then he went to Alberta for certain things. And we have um, Danielle Smith, because she was recently in Ottawa after doing her tour of talking to Republican Americans. 
Yes. And saying, you know, As like a good this, Canadian would. Yes. So, yeah, have me at this committee. I'll come and talk. And it's like, you know, like this. Yeah. I'll. And then the prime minister. And then, of course, you know, she never, well, she really never got invited to the committee, of course, but that was just grandstanding. And then she keeps on saying, well, oh my God, the prime minister came to Alberta and she didn't, he didn't even make time for me. And he turned, apparently they turned around and says, well, she never asked for time. He says, whenever I go to a province, I let the premier know the day before. This, and if they want time with me, I'll make time for them. Mm -hmm. And somebody could turn around, oh yeah, like David Eby in British Columbia got one day's notice about the, no, he didn't get one day's notice about the announcement because it's an announcement. An announcement needs to be planned and prepared. You pick a venue, you reserve it, you make sure that the cameras are going to be there, you send notice to the media. Like this. Yes. But if the prime minister is going somewhere, to not necessarily make an announcement just to do things and sense, you know, I'm going to be in your province. I'm doing business over there. If you want to meet, meet. And you don't actually say, yeah, I would like to meet. Mm -hmm. But then go over all over social media going, the prime minister didn't make time for me. Yeah, I know. Just it's, it's more lies, more lies. More lies. Well, exactly. So she keeps on saying she wants to meet, but she doesn't actually ask for one. <laughs> I want a million dollars. Right. So, but I didn't get it. I didn't get the million dollars. I wanted it, but I didn't get it. Did you work for it? Did you make the, uh, put the effort in to get the million dollars? No, I just want it. Okay. That's not how it works. Right. So the prime minister was in British Columbia earlier this week. Uh, Alberta. No, but yeah, but she was in British Columbia okay. earlier this week to announce $2 billion in additional financing to help deliver thousands of more homes that people with middle incomes who live and work in BC can afford. And Premier David Eby was thrilled with this. All levels of government need to work together to solve the housing crisis with the federal government's contribution and partnership towards BC builds. We can help build more homes people can actually afford. That's good news for our economy and for our future, but most importantly, it's good news for British Columbians looking for a decent place to live. So... All BC builds projects have a target of middle income households spending no more than 30% on their income and rent. So in addition to the $2 billion of financing from the government of Canada, BC builds is supported through an investment of $950 million from the province to ensure units are available at below market rates, as well as $2 billion in provincial low cost construction financing. The BC builds team will help streamline approvals, projects, approvals for projects seeking federal financing to meet the 12 to 18 month concept to construction BC builds timeline. So he announced this money and then he was going to uh, Calgary to make another announcement. And before he went there, he stopped in on Ryan Jesperson's show. It, it was a good interview. Yeah. I want to play the interview on this show. Um, we'll stop it after every subject. But this interview gives me the clear impression that the campaign is on. Oh, yeah. And that the liberals are in it. And it started with the prime minister reacting to Bell Media, saying it was a garbage decision. People go, oh, my God, he's being like particularly candid here. I've never seen the prime minister say I'm pissed off. And I don't think that Doug Ford saw that that was coming because when you saw him in the background, it was like, ah, oh, crap, there goes my media moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he brought some of that to this. Mm -hmm. so Mr. Grizzly, uh, if you would, um, I'm not sure. I, I didn't give you a starting timestamp, unfortunately, so there's some blah, blah and stuff before. Well, I this is queued up at the 39-minute mark. 39, well, 40-minute mark, basically. Oh, no, no. Yeah, no, it, it shouldn't. Yeah, uh, it wasn't me who queued it up. I just sent you uh, my file where it was. That's where the, the interview ends. Um, so there's maybe about a, a minute of like introdu introduction music or something. Uh, I'll, I'll let you let you set it up. I think I got it here. Just okay. So this is full credit to Ryan Jesperson, Real Talk in Edmonton, Alberta. I love their studio, by the way. Um, had we the money, we would build something similar. <laughs> yeah, indeed. 
So there's, a, Prime, there's a lot of money in this studio. So right. well, well done, Ryan. So the prime minister was going, uh, going to Alberta and uh, announced uh, $175 million to build affordable housing in Edmonton, saying that 5,200 new housing units will be built in the city over the next three years. And before doing that, stopped in to his show. So let's play some of that. Okay, here we go. This is the start of it all. be here in person we uh it's uh, nice to talk on the phone but it's better to be here in person it's uh, been a tough six months for you and your government the polls are predicting basically a, a bloodbath next election where's your head at uh, my head's at what we're actually focused on doing which is creating uh, creating opportunities for Canadians, getting through these tough times you know, polls polls had me behind in 2015 before we won polls had me behind in 2019 polls will always go up and down and particularly at a time where people are hurting, people are facing real challenges, the global inflation crisis, the, uh, the disrupted supply chains, the impacts of climate change. There's a lot of things hitting people, including, as you mentioned, the cost of housing and the availability of housing. These are problems that we're focused on trying to solve and we're working on, on, on getting there with partners across the country. And I'm going to stay focused on that rather on the political polls that are, you know, flowing a lot of ink. These these ones seem to be a little bit different, though. Like you've, you've always been the personable guy. You've always been the likable guy. Uh, you've you've had the charisma and that's carried you in past. But but right now you're you know, you're looking at your party pulling 20 points behind the conservatives. You know, your, your personal uh, likability when, when people take a look at your personal net approval of minus 33, it's got to get in your head. Well, Actually, first of all, I think one of the things that carried us through the past is what we actually did in terms of policies. People still think I won the 2015 election because of nice hair. What we won was because of the Canada Child Benefit, because of commitments to invest in communities, because of commitments to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could lower them on the middle class, because of commitments uh, to fight climate change and put more money in people's pockets. And those are the things that we did. And while people talk about what my appearance or whether they want to have a beer with me or not, I've got to stay focused, particularly in this time, on a world that's quite literally on fire in some places. We just declared wildfire season early here in Alberta, uh, dealing with wars around the world, dealing with uh, complexities in a transforming environment and, and economy to actually keep Canadians successful, not just for the coming years, but for the coming decades. That's the job I'm doing. It's not a popularity contest. It's about delivering every single day. That's the thing that drives me. If, if I wanted to be popular, um, I wouldn't have chosen politics. If you want to get things done to build a better country, that's why you get into politics. For what it's worth, and you're referencing the, the, the op-ed, I think, in the Toronto Star this week that suggested that, that Gen Z, that the newest generation, doesn't want to have a beer with you. Back in 2015, I, everybody was talking. I have you seen it? I didn't see that. No, well, in 2015, I, I, there was polling no. that said everybody did want to have. <laughs> they wanted a beer with you over Stephen Harper and Thomas Mulcair at that point. For what it's worth, we're running as we speak an unofficial unscientific twitter poll who would you rather have a beer with and and we've put you on there uh, mr polyev mr singh and, and mr bernier and you're pulling all right 59 percent, which is okay, which is the highest approval hold on you've hold seen on, on all week, i so. don't get to say oh you know what i don't look at national polls and then react to your little poll and say oh isn't that great <laughs> my little looks poll. like people actually like me yeah. you know it doesn't it doesn't work that way the things that matter are the things that matter to Canadians in their daily lives when they're not thinking about politics. Right now, politics is designed to get people riled up uh, and, and you know, take a strong opinion on this or that or the other thing. And people step out of their daily lives to, to get angry about politics, but their daily lives where they're having trouble making the mortgage payment or looking at the grocery bills or worrying about you know, getting, you know, getting care for their parents uh, or worrying about whether they're going to have childcare for their kids, they're not thinking about politics. They're just trying to think about how they're solving the challenges in their life. And so much of politics is disconnected from that right now because people are trying to create wedge issues left, right, and center to get people outraged, to get people motivated, and to prevent people from noticing that a lot of what particularly the right is doing is about stoking up anger without offering any solutions. So is it harder for you to get people's attention? Is, is it harder for you to connect with the middle class than it was 10 years ago? Is there is there like a, a government exhaustion that you see the country uh, um, experiencing right now? That, that might be. Certainly there's there's some of that, you know, just just. Yeah familiarity with with what this government has done is as as do you know, has that impact but people aren't really 
focused on politics right now. Last year, we had a number of by-elections across the country. And by-elections are interesting. We've got one right now in Aaron O'Toole's seat in Ontario, where it's a moment for people to actually think about choices in politics. You know, when you get a poll and you say, okay, you're going to vote for A or B, you're like, you take two seconds and press on the button on your, on your, on your, on your phone. Okay. If you're in a by-election situation, you're actually reflecting on, okay, this actually matters. I'm going to vote. Wh what do I want, want as a community? What do I want in a country? That reflection about what actual consequences are in our democracy doesn't happen a year and a half from an election. So in those by-elections, we actually increased the share of vote. Even though we were way behind in the polls nationally and even regionally, we increased the share of the vote because people are thoughtful when it comes to actually choosing. When it no cost, no friction, being outraged at something. Yeah, it's easy to be outraged at the government in place because everyone out there is blaming us for everything that's going wrong, including you know, Putin deciding to invade Ukraine or climate change or what have you. The fact is, a government's job is to keep plugging away, working hard, solving problems for people, and when the election comes around, people sit back and say, okay, what is the choice we're facing? What kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of solutions are being offered? And you know, where are we going as a country? And who's got the best idea of where we're going as a country? And who's going to be able to deliver that? That's not the conversation being had around politics right now. It's if we're lucky, who do you want to have a beer with? If we're unlucky, you know, who do you most want to see you know, you know, booted out of the country or arrested mm -hmm. for treason? Those conversations are exciting to have in a, a, a you know, political chat but they're not actually constructive in how we're going to deliver for the things that people matter. Yeah, the you talk to need. a lot of people and they'll, they'll talk. <laughs> um, so yesterday, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're like, this is sort of related to this. It's very much related to it. I don't know if you saw what I was tweeting yesterday about, um, you know, let's invite the prime minister for a beer. Let's invite the prime minister to an upcoming pub pubcast and he can join us for a beer and we can sit and talk about anything but politics. I think that would be interesting if we could get the prime minister to sit and have a beer with us, 15, 20 minutes, whatever he can spare. He's a busy man on a Saturday afternoon, sit in the pub with us, have a beer and just talk, not policy, not politics. We could have a separate interview if, if the pubcast was success and if we can make it happen. But I think that would be good because people need to see him as a person and a human and a man. And he's not getting that right now. That interview, full credit to Ryan and his crew, that was so well done. And Ryan, somebody, oh, you were giving him lightweight lob softball. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He wasn't even giving him a warm-up. He literally went in and hit him right from the, right from the get-go. They're not popular. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not a softball. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I'm like, it, I got a, a full respect for Ryan and, and the amount of people that hit Ryan Jesperson with, you're a liberal cock who's paid to do this. And he's like, I wish we were paid to do it. We're not. <laughs> like, yep. And here's the thing, right? That like you see, and we see in the chat, the talk immediately went to authenticity mm -hmm. in the chat. Yes. And that's why as a communications person, I keep on talking about the battle of tone and countertone. There is nothing authentic about Pierre Polyev. Nothing. Other than the fact that he leans into his dickish nature. Side by side, and this is why I would hope that the prime minister calls a long election campaign the next time around, not just a 32 or 36 day one. Side by side, because everything that Pierre Polyev does is in isolation, solo almost pre-recorded because he's not good when he goes off script no he's horrible all those videos are pre-recorded all those questions and question period are pre-written and he practices them in front of the many mirrors and stored away uh under all those lights uh before he goes up there like this all his poses every time he points his finger every time like this all that stuff is planned and calculated but you throw him off script and then he turns around and starts attacking you you throw him off script and he starts saying things like, I believe in puberty blockers for people who are over 18. After puberty has happened. That sounds really stupid. You throw him off script. 
and he needs to feel the air with digital ID. He, he can't think on his feet. Right? Side by side, a prime minister who speaks in this manner authentically versus a guy who's always putting on a show. You need more than 36 days for Canadians to see that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm hoping he calls a long one. Time is not Pierre Polyev's friend. No, it's not. But the energy, the authenticity, I guess, he's not skirting around the questions. No. Direct answers to direct questions, engaging on the topic. He's, he's visibly happy to be there. Yes. He's happy to take on the questions. Taking tough questions is not an issue for this man. He will bring them. And, and we've seen him in town halls where people are coming at him hard. And what does he do? Empathizes, shows compassion and kindness, and, and responds to them like an adult. And the questions and the questioners are not pre-vetted. No, they're not. As opposed to a conservative rally. It, they're not pre-vetted. He will let anybody in as long as you, you know, get, get the pat down, go through the metal detector, make sure you're not a threat to anybody in the room. That's standard, mm -hmm. by the way, for any, any politician of, of that stature, you're going to have to go through the security vetting uh, on site. You can ask whatever question you want. If, you're, if you decide to step to the microphone and ask a question, you can ask whatever you want, and he will respond every single time. The man's not afraid to do that. Right. And let's keep and going. He also, here's right. the other thing. He also doesn't do the, uh, uh, the whole, uh, what, what, what organization are you with? Oh, yes. Jump, just jumps in and asks the question. Now, uh, he mentioned that the by-elections, uh, one coming in Durham, that's on March 4th. So, uh, get ready to vote if you live there. Um, but once again, uh, the liberal candidate in, um, Durham, Robert Rock, there's some video from him on, uh, Twitter from February 21st going, getting ready for the Durham debate. But um, the conservative candidate didn't bother to show up for that one either. So uh, Jamil Giovanni, the guy who showed up at the doorstep while Pierre mm -hmm. and Paul the old lady that Trudeau and his father were Marxists and yeah. said nothing. And then when Pierre, when the prime minister said he was a twofer and that he was an insider and an ideologue, then went to Twitter and had a whole lot to say about how the prime minister was racist. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't know why the prime minister, he said to for, but even though he did, you know, pretending he didn't keep the video going an extra five seconds to hear what the prime minister meant about that suddenly has nothing to say to the people he purports to want to represent. He doesn't even live in the writing. So he wasn't there because Mr. Freedom Guy, Mr. Remove the Gatekeepers, put up a gate and told him, you're not going to go there and speak. And Giovanni is such a leader and man of the people that he didn't tell Pierre Polyev, uh, this is my by-election that I'm running in and give him the middle finger, so screw you, I'm showing up to the debate. Yes, well, a said, puppet. Yes, boss. A puppet. And remained quiet. I haven't heard a peep from him since he made that video about the prime minister being racist for saying twofer. Yeah, he's kind I of... I haven't heard a peep from Giovanni since. Yeah. And now he won't even show up to debates. But freedom. A leader of a political party is directly interfering with the citizen's right to cast a fully informed vote. Here's a rule of thumb. Don't vote for people who interfere with your right to cast a fully informed vote. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. Okie dokie. They're not actually constructive in how we're going to deliver for the things that people matter. Yeah, you talk to need. a lot of people and they'll, they'll talk about, you know, maybe the Liberal Party needs a definitive change at the top. How convinced are you? Are you 100% convinced that you're going to lead this party into the next election? I got into politics to make a difference. 
I got into politics to make this country a better place because a whole bunch of different reasons. I was a school teacher and I saw that that was a way of making an impact. Uh, I loved having a positive impact on my community. I watched my dad have a positive impact on the community. I watched my mom uh, fight for mental health ad advocacy all her life. These are things that I know drive me. Right now, in politics, not just in Canada, but around the world, there is a fundamental question being asked around which way we go as democracies. People have realized that it is easy to instrumentalize anger and outrage and get people to vote in ways that are not necessarily in their best interest. Take you know, the challenges of the United States in the 2016 election, for example. These are things that, that, that can be powerful tools in politics. And they leave, will leave people worse off. For me, I know that Canadians are better than that. I know that Canadians are thoughtful, are looking out for their neighbors, believe in science, believe in building a better future, want real solutions on the table. And the challenge of the next election is going to be definitional in terms of what kind of country we are, which direction we want to go in. Do we stay anchored in science? Do we stay anchored in building for the long term? Do we make sure we're protecting vulnerable people and give them opportunities to contribute? Or do we give in to the easy populism, anger, and division that is so running rampant in every society around the world? That question, that core choice about who we are as Canadians is so fundamentally important that I could not be the person I am and choose to step away from this fight right now when it is so important just because it's getting a little difficult or people are, are, are you know, wondering if, 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 if they're, they're not tired of me or whatever. You know what? Let's talk about the issues. Let's talk about the things that actually matter and let's deliver them for people. And I like, I like that conversation that needs to be had when the next election comes about the kind of country we're going to be. And yes, I will absolutely be part of it. Let's talk about, I mean, you talk about the 2016 presidential election. Let's talk about the 2024 presidential election. What's at stake here? I mean, for, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be a rematch, Biden versus Trump, the prime minister of Canada. The, you know, obviously some tumultuous years uh, with President Trump in office. Uh, how are you approaching what may happen in November? Um, listen, I'm on my third U.S. president. Uh, and, you know, even, even the ones that I was, you know, really close to and, and aligned with like Obama and, 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 and Biden, um, they're not easy. The U.S. interest, the U.S. perspective, the way the U.S. is both polarized and a little more protectionist right now is challenging for Canada no matter what. So anytime there's an election, that's going to get heightened. And regardless of who wins the next election, um, there are going to be challenges where we have to stand up for Canada. I mean, we had to stand up uh, against Biden when he was moving for uh, electric vehicles not to be built in Canada. Uh, we managed to solve that. And the way we solved that was the way we solved for renegotiating NAFTA, which was by demonstrating that it's not in the U.S. interests to be marginalizing or putting barriers in front of Canadian, in, uh, at the Canadian border because it hurts uh, American businesses. The way you approach it is to demonstrate the reliability, the integration, and the work together. And that was something that I was able to do with Donald Trump. We were able to renegotiate NAFTA when he had promised to rip it up in a way that has benefited Canada in a whole bunch of different ways. So. We're going to you know, allow the Americans, obviously, to make their choice next November. Uh, and we're going to stay true to our values and true in our constructive engagement with the United States. Now, I want to talk to you about the future of the carbon tax. Public confidence in it seems to be shot. Right. There, was, there was obviously the, the debacle second. in Atlantic Canada with the heating oil. You've got the CR. Because we're, we're moving to another subject. So I want to just to stop in, in, the, in that subject again. Notice how he answered the question directly, but still remained diplomatic. Oh, yes. Regardless of what the election result is going to be in the United States. Imagine Pierre Polyev in that same situation. Super thin-skinned. Always willing to take a pot shot. This, you don't have to swing at every pitch. The Prime Minister could have gone up there and just dumped on Donald Trump like crazy. Mm -hmm. 
Instead, he made the case that dealing with a Democratic president is also not easy. Well, which is true. Well, you know how they often <laughs> people like to say, uh, the United States is our friend. Not really. Not really. We have a lot of friends there, and we have an uh, amicable relationship. But friends? No, because their interest is always focused on their interest first. And remember, there are no friends in foreign policy. None. Only common interests. That's it. That is it. So no, they're, they're not really our friends. They're friendly. No. We have an amicable relationship. But friends, that's a bit of a stretch. We have a certain inter interdependence. Yes. Well, and look what you just said. Dealing with Donald Trump or dealing with a Democratic president. It's not an easy thing to do because they want to place their interests first. And what was it his father famously said, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're in, in bed with an elephant and the elephant rolls over. Yeah, exactly. So, but again, I can't imagine Pierre Polyev in that situation taking that question. Oh, God, no. And handling it in that type of an adult way. Well, here's something Cassie is saying. Ryan's taken a lot of flack for this interview. And, and I know he did discuss that yesterday on his show because I watch his show frequently. I really like the show, by the way. So, Ryan, if you ever catch wind of this, uh, thank you. You put out a great product. I really like your style. And I love your studio, man. I love your studio. But yeah. he's taking flack for interviewing somebody. It's because we don't like who the you interview. Of the nation. He's the prime minister of Canada. Get over it, people. Jesus Christ almighty. Yeah. I'm like, what? I mean, and, and here's the thing about that thing about would you have a beer? Like, okay, would you willingly have a beer? Or like this, if you had the choice between the prime ministers, I don't know. But I don't know anybody in the right mind, keyword, in the right mind, mm -hmm. who would pass up an opportunity to have 15 minutes with the leader of their nation. Yeah. Yeah, true, right? Really? 15 like, minutes, ask him what you want. Like, yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. I would. Oh, I'd, we're, I'm seriously pursuing trying to get him. Whether I like the better. guy or not, whether I like the prime minister or not. Yeah, I want to sit, yeah. If I have an opportunity to have a beer with the prime minister, I'm going to take it. 15 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, to give him a piece of my mind to, or to let him know what, what, what my priorities are or what matters to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, people answer that socially. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't stand him. He's a liberal cuck. Now, I don't want to have a beer with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what but you're when saying, you sit down and think about yeah, it, it's like so the man you don't like, who you have a chance to actually address head on, face to face, across the table from you with a pint in hand, you can tell him what you think about his policies, which they'll never do. They'll just tell him what they think about him. But, but how he is as a person doesn't affect policy. It's policy, it's legislation, it's bills. Those are the things you need to address. And I find that so many of the, the individuals in the Reform Party side fail to ever address a damn one of them. Why is that? Oh, they just don't like him. Is it because of his hair? Is it because of his name? Is it because of his father? Is it because he's a Laurentian elite? Is it because he was a school teacher? Well, oh, that's the big one. He was a school teacher, so he's not worthy. I'm like, excuse me? So... You hate elites, so if somebody was a school teacher or a bus driver and suddenly they get elected to a position of power and authority, you have no use for them because they're not elite? Like, it's a never-ending cycle of bullshit. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, we have a Kit Saucy here goes, it's also jealousy. You see how men hate Trudeau for no reason and then say he's a pretty boy. They are threatened by a good-looking man who is smart, confident and kind mm -hmm. and this brings me to um something that you may have uh noticed uh oh darn i only have the first part of it oh. darn. um hold on i'll put a pin in that thought because uh marinenshi had a little bit of a run-in with david parker yes i saw that I address that too. I don't know if yeah, it's on my addressing yeah. thereof. Uh, yes. So David Parker put out a tweet going, the fact that a man as grotesque 
as Nenshi, ever won Sexiest Man of the Year in Calgary, let alone four years in a row, tells you everything you need to know about mainstream media in Alberta. Okay, first of all, David Parker's no prize. Well, and boy, did he take it on the chin for that comment. Oh, really, David? Well, then please tell us, who is the sexiest man? Who is the man that you find the most attractive in Calgary? He got real quiet on that. Yeah. I was like, I was like Ma Parker, if you're watching, I know this will probably escape your mental capacity to be able to grasp, but many people believe that both intelligence and kindness are sexy. Mm-hmm. Ugly's on the inside, sweetie, and ugly starts with you. Okay? But the way Nenshi uh, responded to it was absolutely freaking brilliant. <laughs> uh, here it is, right here, Mr. Grizzly. I'll put it up there since we're talking about it. Please. I'm not sure how to respond. Thanks for your interest, I guess. Hope you find a sexier man to satisfy you, or just you seem scared of something. I wonder what. Here's a nice memory for you. Plus, it annoys my sister. So, bonus, Nenshi is sexy. <laughs> Posts the magazine cover. <laughs> okay. But David Parker says that this man is grotesque. Because intelligence is grotesque. Kindness is grotesque. Ability to build bridges between people I hope to have is the, grotesque. The grace that, that Mr. Nenshi has. I, I hope to someday have the grace that he has in the way he dresses haters. I'm getting there. I'm working on it. I'm trying to become better all the time at addressing the haters by thank you for the engagement. We appreciate it. Every time you engage with us just increases our numbers and we, we can... Go after more uh, advertising revenue. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. That's the only way to deal with the haters is to greet them with kindness because it drives them out of their minds. And one of two things happen. They run screaming and crying to the corner or back under the rock they you know, live under or to their mom's basement because according to Pierre Polyev, all everybody over 35 yes. lives in their mom's basement, their parents' basement. But either way, if, if you respond to them with kindness and politeness and some grace, it either shuts them up, changes their mind, or makes them run away. And it's one of the three. They seldom or ever they come back again to hit you hard. Or uh, some of them get real mad. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just come back with real more kindness mad. until they run away. Exactly. It drives them nuts. It drives them nuts. Yep. It, it, don't, give the can- don't give the baby the candy they're looking for. Zig when they expect you to zag. Let's keep going because now we're talking about carbon tax. It's going to get real good here. Well, this I love this comment from Linda. Parker is terrified of how big a hole and she can cut through the UCP if he becomes NDP leader. Because he can build bridges. Yes, he can. He can. Absolutely. We'd, we would love... Mr. Nenshi, if you ever happen to see this show, if anybody can get this show to Mr. Nenshi, I've tried to, we would love to have him come on uh, for, for yeah, as well. an in-depth chat. Because I don't think we really interview people as much as we just have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, policy gets addressed, but it's not like we're grilling people with questions. We're, we want to have a conversation with you. So, sir, we want to know what makes people tick. Exactly. We want to know who you are as a person. Because I think if we can get to know you as a person, once you personalize somebody, it's a little bit harder for people to hate on them. Right? Which is why Joe Biden won the election. Yes. Because no matter what they tried to tar him with, the guy's been around for 30-something years. He's a known years. quantity. 50 years. They're 50 years, yeah, now. But he's a known quantity. Mm-hmm. It, it, it just couldn't be done. That's why he was the best choice then. Well, and, and this is exactly, Mohan is right, can't be bought. David Wallace. Also. A man whose job was to buy people off said, you cannot buy Mr. Nenshi off. He says, I wanted him to be corrupt. He's not. And clearly we know that Daniel Smith is for sale. Oh, yeah. Okay, shall we continue? Right. We, we continue. can't show the whole thing because, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't go that, that full length. It stops at about like 39 minutes, but it, it's worth yeah, it. No, no, no. Really we'll show a few it. more and then, uh, and yeah. You like, you like this background, Christian, or do you want me to change it? I'm just playing around with stuff. 
United States. I want to talk to you about the future of the carbon tax. Public confidence in it seems to be shot. There was there was obviously the debacle in Atlantic Canada with the heating oil. You've got the CRA declaring Saskatchewan as the provider of natural gas. Looks like Premier Mo's pretty intent on not paying what that province owes to federal coffers when it comes to that carbon tax. It's been the defining policy of your time as uh, Prime Minister. I know that your government's uh, attempting to rebrand it. How committed are you to sticking with it as Canada's climate action tool? Um, putting a price on pollution is a profoundly small c conservative idea the idea of letting market forces drive innovation instead of using the heavy hands of regulation the idea of saying well listen there is a cost to pollution in the atmosphere that everyone recognizes including alberta government by saying no we need to get to net zero by 2050 and the easiest mechanism to do that is to put a price on the pollution that we admit that is causing negative consequences, including wildfires that are costing billions of dollars across the country and lives and livestock. So what we knew though, was when we put forward that price on pollution, it was gonna hit families across the country. And therefore, instead of saying the profits from the pollution will pull them into greener industries, which is probably the best way of accelerating carbon reduction, we said, no, we have to build in affordability. And that's why we put money back in average households' pockets that is greater than the cost of the price on pollution. So here in Alberta, this coming year, uh, $1,800 no, $1, is the Canada carbon rebate that they're going to be getting. A family of four gets $1,800 back, which is more than they pay with the price on but pollution. But you've said this a lot, and people have heard this message a lot, and it doesn't seem to be landing. It doesn't seem to be resonating. You probably know, or maybe you don't, the two of the three declared candidates in the Alberta NDP leadership race. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing to get chirped from the right on the carbon tax. This is the left. Two of the three candidates say it's time to move on from the consumer carbon tax. How does that land with you? Well, listen, first of all, uh, when we brought in the price on pollution, the carbon tax in, in 2015, the NDP stood against it then, too. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't particularly want it. But environmentalists, environmental organizations know that putting a price on pollution and allowing the market to actually drive solutions is one of the best ways of doing it. And putting more money back in the pockets of 8 out of 10 Canadians makes a lot of sense. Now, the political fight that has been created around this, uh, whether it's Scott Moe or Danielle Smith or, or others trying to uh, instrumentalize, or Pierre Polyev, of course, who never talks about the, the $450 rebate check that comes in every three months to the, the family of four in Alberta's pockets, that he would actually take away if he were to scrap the tax. There is no way to fight climate change in a more efficient way that puts more money back in Canadians' pockets than putting a price on pollution. But as I've said many times, the federal program is a backstop. If a province wants to come up with a way to price carbon in a different way and do different things with that money, as long as it's equivalent to what everyone's doing across the country, they can do that. So if, if a, a new government in, in, in Alberta wants to uh, change the way they put a price on pollution, knock themselves out. What matters is that we continue to send to industry a very clear signal that those who invest in innovative solutions, those who reduce their carbon emissions, will it get advantage, will not be penalized for having made investments that are good for workers, good for the environment, good for the economy of the future. I want to ask you about your environment minister, uh, Stephen Gilbo, who's essentially made headlines with his no more new roads comments. It sounds like the underlying theme, he believes Canada's road infrastructure is adequate to meet upcoming population growth. Alberta, uh, you obviously know, expected to see its population double over the next 25 years, which will require probably significant investment in infrastructure. Do you agree with your environment minister do you disagree uh, he has he has since explained his comments as speaking about specifically a quebec city project that that we we all disagreed with including with quebec city di uh, disagreed with the the issue is that we have as a government invested massively in road infrastructure across this country we widened the yellowhead uh, highway we've uh, invested hundreds of million dollars in the calgary ring road uh, we're going to continue to invest in infrastructure the 
underlying point is we need to make sure we're building the right infrastructure for the future. That means investing a lot more in public transit, but that does mean uh, building more roads where they're necessary. We have ice roads that are no longer holding across the northern prairies uh, because of climate change. We're going to have to build new roads to get to a distant community, to get to resource projects. These are things that the federal government will continue to be a part of, but we have to be thoughtful about the ways the world are changing and be there to respond to it. You're making a series of housing announcements across the country, including right after you talk to us uh, here in Edmonton. It'll be you, the mayor of Edmonton, your former colleague, Amarjeet Sohi, former infrastructure minister, uh, Minister Randy Boss, no jobs minister as well. The province not invited uh, to the announcement. Is, is this going to be the new model? Is it going to be your government, the feds partnering with municipalities? Um, one of the things that we know in terms of building housing is the provinces have a huge role to play. And yesterday, I was in BC announcing a $2 billion federal investment in a BC builds program that is totally run by uh, the, the, the province to create uh, middle income rental housing like for firefighters or teachers in urban centers where they're being pushed out to the suburbs by using underutilized public or nonprofit land. So that's something the federal government's doing with provinces and we encourage other provinces uh, to step up and do the same thing because we'll step up to the same level that they will. But we also know that working specifically with municipalities is a way of getting things done. Our rapid housing initiative uh, over the past years has created thousands of new units uh, across Alberta, uh, in Calgary, in, in Edmonton, and we've done that with the pro with the city specifically. The housing accelerator is a slightly different model. It's saying instead of saying, okay, we're building 120 unit with uh, partial federal money on this corner, we're, we're building a, a 80 person seniors residence over here with federal money, we're gonna continue to do that through different programs. But the thing we're trying to do is change the underlying way cities look at housing. How can we increase densification? How can we make sure that you have four units as of right on any given residential plot? How can you uh, automatically be able to build four stories or a, a new garden unit uh, in a lane? How can you make sure that we're accelerating the d zoning around transit stations to build more densification so people can walk to transit than to walk to work? How are you using uh, more public, including federal land, uh, to leverage housing quicker? How do you cut down red tape? The $4 billion investment that we have in the housing accelerator is all about changing the way municipalities approve and get housing built to not just create thousands, but much more than that over the coming years because we've changed the structure of the way housing is built in this country to make make deep changes in the, the housing supply issues. Before we run out of time, I want to ask you about the future of, of two industries. Uh, one big government investment. You've promised uh, one of the biggest uh, gar government-led asset sales in Canadian history. That, of course, is, is the Trans Mountain Pipeline. It, it's gone over budget. Soon, uh, capacity to get Alberta crude to the coast will be tripled. It's expected that Canada will take a loss on the sale. We don't know for sure yet. What will mark... Uh, in your mind, uh, a successful investment? How will you evaluate that investment when it's all said and done? First of all, buying the Trans Mountain Pipeline wasn't about hoping to turn a profit for the government. It was about making sure that Alberta crude uh, was not landlocked, was not prisoner to one single customer in the United States. I took a lot of grief across the country for buying a pipeline, but I knew that if we want to be able to pay for the innovation, the transformation of our economy to be greener, to be cleaner, we need to get the best possible price for our oil products now. And that means uh, getting out across the Pacific. And that meant twinning the Trans Mountain Pipeline. That's why we bought the pipeline, because it was good for Alberta and it's good for the country. Now, um, it is finally about to be completed, and that'll be good news for the industry. And now, the government shouldn't be in the business of owning or running pipelines. We had to secure it. We had to de-risk it so that it could get completed. Now that it's about to be completed, uh, we're looking at hopefully being able to sell it to Indigenous partners so uh, they can actually uh, benefit from it in a way that Alberta's actually done a lot of over the past years. Mm. This is a good step around reconciliation. It's a good step around making sure we're getting a better price for our oil uh, while we look at innovating in ways that we can actually grow the economy and protect people in the future. The problem I have with the oil sands or had with the oil sands over many years is that people were doubling down and not preparing for the future. And that perhaps was something that a country, a company can pivot off of in a decade or two and just change their investments. But Albertans working in the oil sands, they need to have 
other jobs that they can do. And that's why our investments in things like, like hydrogen, like Dow Chemical, our investments in, uh, in, for, in sending renewable money into Alberta to innovate is so important. I was talking with the Alberta Business Council uh, just last fall who were really frustrated about the pause uh, that the Alberta government put on renewables investment. Uh, hopefully that is going to end next week because... Alberta has always been leading the way on investments. And the secret of, 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 of that environmentalists in Canada don't necessarily want to acknowledge is we don't get to reach our targets. We don't get to thrive in a net zero world as a country unless Alberta is part of leading the way with the innovation, with the transformation, with the hydrogen, with the carbon capture utilization of storage, with the kinds of, of, of solutions that Albertans have always brought forward on energy. Canada can and should be the reliable provider of net zero uh, energy in a net zero world by 2050. And if we're gonna be that, we need Albertans to be thinking and working on that every single day. And having a government in Alberta that won't even talk about the reality of climate change is putting the brakes on making sure there are good jobs for Albertans in the energy sector for decades to come. That's what I'm focused on. And the, the fear-mongering and distraction of the right is actually harming Albertans' approach. Yeah, so what can you do? Okay. Now, the reason I wanted this section in particular, right? Mm -hmm. Housing mm -hmm. explains everything everything why the fund exists the difference between acceleration fund and the other stuff when he's talking about roads he knows specifically what roads he can point to specific projects mm -hmm. ring road the yellowhead road <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> when he's talking about pipe the pipeline tmx why he bought it what's the reason <clears throat> why the government doesn't want to keep on operating it because government shouldn't be operating those business he has his answers. He has clear and definite examples. He is on top of the files. He can go to specific projects and relate them to the actual region that he is in and talking about them. Oh, yeah. Compare and contrast with your alternatives. <laughs> I don't even want to think about that. He knows the when, where, how, and why of all the policies. And he can explain it. Well, he's an adult, behaving like an adult should in the position that he's in. Meanwhile, the conservatives can't explain why carbon pricing works and how the rebate works. And again, that was a conservative idea. Yes. It's literally Harper's plan. Yeah. He just didn't cancel it. <laughs> uh, well, let, let, I really want to have him join us for a podcast where we can sit down and, and have a conversation with him. And, and honestly, and, and I know you're probably leery of this, but I, I don't want to talk politics. I want to have a conversation with him as a person. And then we can tell him, let's set up an interview later when we can talk politics. But I think having him in the pub on a Saturday afternoon, having a pint with him to show that people want to have a beer with the PM because he's a nice man. Might not like his politics, but I mean. Yeah. All right. Now, um, okay, so I, I'm going to follow your lead here and not show the rest of it because I was prepared to show the whole thing. We, we can't um, necessarily do that without... I mean, we'd have to go to Ryan and say, listen, we're going to show your whole thing. Mm -hmm. We're group watching it because it's worth for people to oh, see. Agreed, agreed. It's just, it's not our content is, is what I'm getting at. So. Yeah, but that's what we do. We comment on content. It, it, agreed, but, but I want to, but I want you to show what I'm this part here. Um, not that I disagree with that, but these interviews are typically presented beforehand, so the person being interviewed is prepared and even sometimes control the error. No, no, they're not. No, they're not, actually. They're not. They're not, actually. The, the most that people will ask for is, can you give us some general topics? And that's about it. That will be discussed so that you can prepare content to respond to the topics, but they're not given the questions. When we had um, Senator Brazo on, mm -hmm. because his office asked, what topics do you want to, to discuss? And we sent a list of topics, but we did not send the questions no. whatsoever. 
And we said on the list of topics, like I said, that we are willing and we probably will want to get into the darker side of his past. Mm-hmm. That we were going to ask about that. And he was very forthright about it. Yeah. It's very, 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 very important. Um, so we'll skip to the end. Yeah, some people, yeah, you're right, Michael. Some people will say that there are certain topics that are off limits. And even on our show, you know, we say, listen, if there's something we're asking about and you don't want to talk about it. You don't it, have to. Like this, you literally just have to say, you know what, I don't, I don't, don't really want to talk about that. And we'll move on to another mm-hmm. question. Because someone saying we don't want to talk about that reveals a lot mm-hmm. on its own. But we will still ask the question. Yes. But there are certain people that, that do try to put those types of conditions. And if that happens, you refuse the interview. Period. Period. What are you going to ask? An ethical outlet We're gonna, will return. Yeah, we'll discuss these topics. Well, we, we need the questions. Sorry, no. That's not how it works. Sorry, no. Yes. Or you can ask him about this, but don't ask about that. Well, then sorry, you can't be on the sorry. show. No. No. And again, yeah. we're mostly having a conversation. We don't grill people with questions because it's not who we are and it's not what we want to do. We want to get to know political people as people and in turn help you get to know who they are as people because they seldom ever get to do that in their roles. So if we can provide you with a look into the nuance that is the person that we're sitting here chatting with, well, that's good for them and good for you and good Mm -hmm. for politics, by the way, and democracy. Yeah. So we'll fast forward. I've sent you another clip. It's the last three minutes. Like this I found was the moment. Mm -hmm. And, and you heard what Daniel Smith said about this. I did not oh, hear what she said. We'll discuss that. this after we watch okay. it. Okay. But this is the moment. Governments should get out of the way of Albertans actually innovating and creating that better future that they can work and build and deliver. If you can build a pipeline for, for, for oil sands oil, you can build a pipeline for hydrogen. If you can you know, build the, the, the technology necessary for an oil sands refinery, you can build the technology necessary for hydrogen's plant. These are things that Albertans will have great jobs in in the future if the Alberta government let, gets out of its ideological opposition to doing things that are good for workers, good for the planet, maybe not good for classic oil sands companies, except that they're also investing massively in decarbonization and renewables. This is the, this is the dynamic that, quite frankly, Albertans are getting fooled by right-wing politicians on. Mm, I, I can already hear Premier Smith's response to this and the, the oil company's CEO's responses to this. And they're going to say, did Justin Trudeau just tell us that that government ideology needs to get out of the way of innovation in the oil sands? And I know that, that yes. they're going to tear their hair yes, out because absolutely. they feel that it's you that's been imposing liberal imposing ideology what? onto okay, the oil so, sands. So what have we imposed on the oil sands? You know what? The, the, we, we got literally dozens, if not hundreds of questions people wanted us to ask you. And a lot of people working in traditional oil and gas mm-hmm. still don't believe as much as you pound on this table as much as you talk about the the personal political risk that you took investing in tmx they don't feel like you've had the industries back they don't feel like you've had alberta's back and i know don't that's think on i don't radar. think the oil industry has had the back of the oil sands workers i don't think the industry by dragging its heels on decarbonization uh, in some sectors. Some, some of the oil sands companies have been really innovative and are leading the way on that. And that, that is great. And we are encouraging them and we're investing with them. And we're supporting them in decarbonization investments. But those who are crossing their hands and saying, you know what? The world's still going to need oil for another decade or so, we, another few decades. It's still going to need every drop that we can produce. So why would we raise our costs right now and invest in innovation when we can just do the th- same things we've been doing for decades and make profits. And the fact that we're going to leave people with a dirty mess and no jobs because we haven't prepared for the jobs of the future, well, that's a problem for the next generation in this community. My job as a company, as a shareholder, is to draw profits out right now. That is what is hurting oil sands workers. And they've been, they've been fooled by people who are saying, oh, no, no, the climate change is a liberal or a Chinese plot. You don't have to worry about it. Just keep doing things exactly as they were a decade ago, two decades ago. That's not preparing for the future that Albertans, like all Canadians, know is changing. 
Boom. That's how you flip that script. Yep. So Daniel Smith's response to that was he called Albertans fools. No, he didn't. No, no he did not. You lying. <sighs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be nice. You liar. That was a lie, Danielle, and you damn well know it. He never said that. He never said that. And Ryan Jesperson yesterday when I was listening to his show came out and said that same thing about Danielle Smith. No, she lied about that. He never said that. That's not what he said. She twisted the words to make it look like he called Albertans fools. He never said that. I like Ryan Jesperson because he, he, he's, he's being honest and giving you facts and giving you the truth. I like his show. I like him as a person from what I know of him. I don't know him personally, but from what I know and you know, uh, our, our friend Charles Adler is on his show frequently. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're right. You're right now, here, James. Jesperson was right, uh, was right though. Trudeau is having trouble getting the message to stick and it isn't all because the opposition are such good propagandists. Indeed. Indeed. The liberals' comms have been terrible. Horrible. Horrible. Now, we have this interview and Alberta was about to table a budget and Daniel Smith delivered a pre-budget statement that was about eight minutes long. Um, I don't have timestamps specifically, so I don't know if we should just show the whole eight minutes, but there are a couple of things in there when you compare and contrast to this, because her shtick has been all along that the prime minister and that the liberals want to kill the oil industry. And that's why you buy a pipe because you want to kill the industry. <laughs> right. And he mentioned it, right? It's almost like he listens to the show. It's like, you know, he got punched in the teeth. He took great political risk. He lost a lot of political capital. He did the left on doing that. And he got no credit from the right, mm -hmm. but he made a decision that was in the best interest of the country. Well, here's a great comment from Linda. And I completely agree with you. There's only one problem, Linda. There's only one problem. If Trudeau would keep talking like this, he'd start winning over a lot more people. Completely agree. Here's the problem. The amount of, of venomous vitriol that was thrown at Ryan Jesperson for literally just having the man on the show is ridiculous. They hate Trudeau so much, they refuse to even listen to what he has to say. There is a percentage of the Canadian populace that will despise him and ignore everything he has to say. Even if he says, congratulations, everybody's getting a $10,000 check this month because we got a big kickback from some carbon tax rebate from an uh, offshore oil company that owed us all this tax revenue. So everybody gets it. I don't care. I hate you. That's their attitude. They simply don't want to listen to what he has to say, even when he's saying things that will benefit them and make their lives better. They don't want to hear it. It falls on deaf yeah. ears, unfortunately. But that being said, if he continues to hammer home that message, if he continues to do what he's been doing lately, and every time Pierre Polyev spews some bullshit line that he comes right back and attacks him with it, with facts, like he did the other day when he says he's already attacking our policy that he's not even read. Do more of that. Do more of that. And he will start winning over hearts and minds, just like he did in 2015. Yeah. So here's what I'll do. I think I'll save the Daniel Smith okay. thing for Monday. Um, but in that video, when she's talking about it, she's talking about a day when Alberta pumps its last barrel of oil mm. out. The whole shtick has been that he wants to end it. And she's the one that's talking about a day when it ends in this video. And in this video, she breaks a major election campaign. Oh, 
because she promised a major tax cut. Now, she didn't necessarily promise it was going to happen this year. No. But she's delaying it at a time where people are beating the drum about affordability, at a time where the premier of New Brunswick is trying to buy votes with another $300 check. Well, he's sitting on two and a half billion. Oh, yes. People, yeah. $75 million out of two and a half billion and thinking that the New Brunswickers are going to go for that cheap. Mm -hmm. She is sitting there and talking about a day when oil is about to end. She's delaying the tax cut. She's actually talking about how the heritage fund was not properly managed. That was conservative governments who did that. Yep. But they, they'll, the they'll conveniently leave that out, right? Because we can't yes. have that in the conversation. And she's basically saying that they're going to shift focus on financial management to pay down provincial debt and put excess funds into the heritage fund to get it to $250 billion worth of worth by, I think it is, 2050. I think it is her goal. So 26 years later, when she won't be around. Conveniently, this happens to be the year where she has to negotiate new contracts with public servants and nurses and teachers and all that kind of stuff. So what she's saying is, well, because the price of oil has gone down for a bit and we need to get ourselves off of using royalty revenue to finance our everyday operations, Something everybody on the left has been telling Alberta for decades. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, but all of a sudden she's like found this gospel. It's like, gee, we really screwed the pooch. So all these things that I promised you, um, I've got nothing for you. And all you people that are going to be coming to me in an affordability crisis looking for more money to be able to pay your rent. Yes. Sorry, I got nothing for you. Because I'm going to take all that money and put it towards paying down the debt and put it into a heritage savings fund so that we, the government, can make more interest on it rather than giving it to you so that you can pay down some debt and pay less interest. Mm -hmm. She's pulling a bait and switch. Of course she is. The typical conservative bait and switch. The same thing she did because she promised when it comes to energy, that her program was going to be a reduction. It was going to be a rebate. She was going to give the money back. And then all of a sudden turns around, she got into power and says, oh, no, no, it was just a deferment. You have to pay that now. Now she's doing it with a proposed tax mm -hmm. cut. Right on time. For salary to go there. Oh, oopsie, sorry. We're out of money. You know, that old... And testament. again, in a video with not the soft music, but beautiful lighting, mm -hmm. and she's sitting at the desk, and she's got all her hair done. Again, she has media training. All poised and, 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 and smiling. So, you know, like this, this is an exciting time for Alberta because we're going to be doing this stuff and setting ourselves up great for the future, which means you get nothing now. During an affordability crisis, all the stuff I promised you to get elected, you got to wait longer for. Oh, well. Ah, uh, the beauty of pulling shit in the first year of your majority. Hoping that three years later, people will have forgotten. We warned you. We told you this would happen. We tried to help you. You didn't listen. Once again, proving what we say. Once you first accept and understand that Danielle Smith will always first choose to lie, then you can kind of understand what it is she's going to do mm -hmm. and what it is she is doing. She's screwing over Alberta. Yeah, doesn't care. Hey, she'll get her. She'll get her money. Yeah. 
limit spending increases to the for the foreseeable future to inflation plus any increase in population, pay down the province's debt, and put excess funds into the Heritage Fund. Had previous conservative and NDP governments done this, the fund would now be generating enough interest and investment income to replace unsteady resource revenues. I have something for you, and it's Daniel Smith, and I'm going to put okay. it on the screen, and uh, I'll read it. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau spoke with Alberta media during which he managed to call Albertans fools. He didn't do that. Claimed the carbon tax was saving Alberta families thousands of dollars. It does. And condemned anyone supportive of parental involvement in their child's education. What? We know that Albertans do not take this absurd, his absurd claims seriously. None of his claims were absurd. However, it is sad to see this Prime Minister, like his father before him, try to use Alberta as a punching bag to win votes in other parts of the country. He didn't do that. He bought you a pipeline. Just like you use Quebec and Atlantic Canada as a punching bag to win votes in your own it's province? okay when you do it, but he didn't even do that. Instead of attacking our province, Mr. Trudeau could have informed our government about his visit to Alberta and extended an invitation to meet with me to discuss our amazing energy sector and workers. He did. You were informed. He did. You didn't call it. You didn't take him up on it. Nice try, Danny. Alberta Green Technologies that are changing the world, removing red tape for struggling childcare operators or the housing and affordability challenges. You shut down the green energy sector, Danny. You're the one that put the red tape in. You're the one that's not forwarding the money to the daycares. You're making them float you. Next time the Prime Minister visits Alberta, I hope he calls my office to arrange a meeting as he did with the Premiers of Ontario, BC, and Manitoba. I await his call. He let you know you refused to meet with him. Phones work both ways, Danny. I mean, how many lies are in that statement? Wow. You're right about that. Uh, you're right about that, James. She sounds like a woman scorned instead of a premier. It's like, good God, woman. You lied so many times in one tweet. I, I just, I can't get over that. She will always first choose to lie well in the first response from aaron hoyland the carbon tax will cost our household 300 dollars for natural gas this year and 530 dollars for gasoline we will receive a rebate of 1800 dollars. so yeah it will save us about a thousand dollars a year but i get it math is hard <sighs> i tell you well, and the people calling her out, Trudeau didn't call Albertans fools. He said, people like you are trying to fool working Albertans. You just proved his point. The PM announced he'd be in Edmonton and hold a press conference. He did not sneak in. He didn't invite you because you claim he's destroying your province, which is currently producing more oil and gas than ever, and soon to have a two-tied pipeline, thanks to PM Trudeau. I asked the PM why he didn't meet with the Premier, with Premier Smith today. His response, always happy to meet with any Premier whenever they ask me to meet. PM staff said they gave Smith a day ahead alert he'd be in Alberta as they do with all Premiers. It's up to her to ask for a meeting. So Danny, you lying, two-faced, duplicitous person. You, you, mm -hmm. you can't continue to do that and think you're going to get away with it and we're not going to fact check you on it. Mm -hmm. You lied to people. We, we have you in your lies. Misrepresented everything. We have, we can counter every single one of your lies. Like it, and the worst part is her base will swallow this up. <sighs> because they won't bother to take the time to listen to the interview, which is one of the reasons why I'm trying, I'm trying to show it because when the prime minister does something, you know, we do this often when he makes like a particularly good speech and I take out segments and I go throughout the whole speech. It says, people are busy. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you're taking the time to tune in here at the Beaver Lodge, the least we can do, and it's literally the least yes. because these shows are not hard to prepare for us. No. When we're taking clips and saying, here, here, here. Because that's the thing. You can go somewhere. You can go on this show and give a 39-minute interview and knock it out of the park. But if no one hears about it, no one sees it, if it doesn't go national, 
if there aren't people like us that are taking, you know, the, I watched it so you don't have to, like we did with the federal court decision. If there isn't people like us doing that, then all you get is the 30-second soundbite. You get that last little clip in isolation, those three minutes, and you get people going, oh, well, no, he betrayed us. Well, but. but if you heard everything that came before, you know how he got there at, that, at the end. All the stuff that he's talked about, climate change, and why he bought TMX, and how he realized he took the hit, and why it was important to make sure that Alberta's resource had more than just one market to go to. All of that stuff feeds in to that final answer. It's not just posturing. It's not just posing. It's not just preening. There's thought. There's substance. There's passion. There's commitment. These things matter. but you have to see it and there's so much content and there's a whole industry, very, very, very profitable industry dedicated to counter programming. The prime minister says he does something for one reason. And this is, I'm not talking about our prime minister, but the prime minister, any prime minister will say something. And in 2024, there is an industry that is set as soon as someone says it, and even before they say it. Always going there to make a housing thing. Oh, lucky he's going to screw us. Like, s dedicated to pre framing things as being the opposite as what they are. And once they happen, spinning and twerking things as the opposite as what they are. As we just saw with Danielle Smith's mm -hmm. tweet. She took that interview, torqued it, twisted, and contorted it. Brutally. And she said that everything that happened was literally the opposite of what you just saw. And the target market for that are people, oh, he went on that Cuck Ryan Jesperson show. I'm not going to watch what he has to say. And then she, she could take that little thing. Of course. They're trying to fool Alberta. Oh, you said we're fools. No, they said we're trying to fool you, but you just got to focus on the word fool. Oh, I heard the fool part. It's like when somebody says, you're pretty stupid. I heard the pretty part. <laughs> and you walk away. Yeah. <laughs> right? You think I'm pretty. Just, Thank you. No, I said you're pretty stupid. I, I heard the pretty part. I heard what I wanted to. <clears throat> so which is actually something I do when trolls. <laughs> uh, but because it drives them nuts. But some people literally do that for a career. Because they'll only hear the key word. They'll jump on the key word or they'll twist and they'll torque. This is what they need to do. This is what they need to do in order to make the narrative fit. And you'll notice, we, we showed you about 19, to, about 15 minutes of it? 19 minutes Something of it? Something like that, yeah. How many times did he mention Podiev? Uh, did he? My name. No. I was going to say, I don't think he mentioned him at all. Not yet. I think that later on, at one point, he might, he might mention it like this, but in that, that whole period, everything that we showed him, his name never entered his mouth. Polyev can't open That's his Polyev. mouth without saying Trudeau six times in a two-minute interview. Exactly. All right. Moving on from that, um, there's a little thing, a little thing. There's a big thing going on. Um, i got to wrap up Robert soon. I have Picton. a meeting shortly. Yep. Robert Picton. Yeah, they're losing their minds over the fact that he's eligible for parole. Yep. He has a parole hearing. Yeah. Eligible. It's the same thing as Paul Bernardo. Eligible. Eligible. So you got uh, not RuPaul. Rupa Subramania puts out a tweet that has all the pictures of the women 
that Robert Picton killed. As she writes, a serial killer and serial rapist who is suspected of cannibalism and feeding the remains of his victims, pictured here to pigs on his pig farm, is now eligible for day parole in Canada. I can't think of a single civilized nation on the planet that would allow him to be eligible. No, that's, that's how our criminal justice system works. You, everybody is eligible. You don't have to like it, but the rights apply to everybody or they apply to nobody. Okay, exactly. So she takes all those faces mm -hmm. when you take a collage of people's faces mm -hmm. that were victims of a serial killer or a mass murderer like Polytechnique Montreal or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. and you do that with it you dishonor all their memories you wrap yourself in righteousness, but you sully the memories of all these dead people. Well, and, and let's to not make forget. a point. When, when, that when did he people? When did he go into jail? Was it two thousand three or two thousand eight? I don't recall. But either way, uh, Justin Trudeau wasn't the prime minister then. Yeah, but that doesn't the, that that's irrelevant to this. Part. No, I know, but it's the way they. The part is it. that he's getting it. Yes, but here it is. It's. I can't think of a single civilized nation on the planet that would allow him to be eligible. No. Every civilized nation on mm -hmm. the planet recognizes that every human being who is incarcerated is entitled to at least be heard. Yeah. Doesn't mean you get it. Eligible doesn't mean you get it. But she is sitting there and saying, in Canada, we should be a country where people we don't like, well, we can just suspend their charter rights yeah. to ask. Now, the charter applies to everyone, no exceptions. Everyone or no one. Even awful, terrible people. Just like her. So we have this thing again. Every time a notorious killer exercises their constitutional right to a hearing, though we all know it has no chance of succeeding, At all. you can count on the fear congruers. Mm. It's a procedure that has to take place, but that's it. Yes. You can count on the fear. You can set your watch by it. Mm -hmm. You can count on these fear congruers to rise up like they're totally new to the Canadian legal system an attempt to raise money off pretending their release is imminent mm -hmm. or making the claim that the government of the day should directly interfere with the judiciary and determine that for particularly unsavory people, they don't need rights. Sorry, can't do that. That's not what a civilized Again, nation does slippery slope oh yeah because while we could all agree that robert picton and paul bernardo should probably remain behind bars for the rest of their natural mm -hmm. lives and maybe a couple of years beyond that and make sure that they don't come back like freddie or jason <laughs> <laughs> right it's like he's dead yeah keep him in for another yeah, two just, years just, just to make sure <laughs> just to make keep sure him in the prison right? morgue while we could probably all agree on that once we start agreeing that people we don't like should not even get a hearing that sets a bar that can then be moved on what is people that we don't like. And then the criteria becomes less and less. Then the criteria of people that we don't like that who should stay in jail for the rest of their life and not even get a hearing doesn't get limited to just serial killers and rapists. Indeed. These are, again, thin edge of the wedge things. Taking the absolute worst case scenario and saying, let's create policy for everyone based on the worst case scenario. And then once we have that, then let's move the bar. Mm -hmm. Abortion. Let's create some type of thing 
that says it's not a medical procedure, any type of law whatsoever. But let's get people to agree that there should be like some type of legislation around abortion. And once we get that legislation, then we can start chipping away at it until it's all gone. That's why in Canada, it's a good thing that abortion is considered to be a medical procedure. And not like in the United States where they're saying, well, well, you know, the late term or what term. No, we let the medical professional determine that. But it's a decision between you and your doctor because you do not want to create that precedent. Well, here's where we set the bar. Okay, now let's negotiate about where the bar should be now. And then five years later, okay, should the bar change again? Should the bar change again? Rather than adhering to an overall principle. Mm -hmm. The overall principle is that our incarceration system believes in rehabilitation. We know that there are certain people that cannot be rehabilitated. But if we put someone in prison and assume from the get-go this person can never be rehabilitated, Mm -hmm. we've dehumanized someone. Mm -hmm. You have to let someone prove that they cannot be rehabilitated. You can't start off with, well, you're a depraved serial killer. You can't be rehabilitated. Even though we know most serial killers, pretty much all of them, can't be rehabilitated. Mm-hmm. They're sociopaths. They can't be rehabilitated. But you have to go through the process. Because well, if you eliminate it for one, I mean, it's the same thing when we hear people say, oh, it's like, why is this woman defending this man in court who's a rapist? Because everybody's entitled to a zealous defense. Why is Tamara Leach mm-hmm. not saying that she's a rapist? I mean, no, I know here in the thing. So, but Greenspun, we keep on saying we're glad that she has yeah. it. Yeah, and he's a because damn she's good lawyer. to a zealous defense, and he's a good lawyer. Because if she loses with Greenspun defending her, you know she's lost. Yeah. Oh yeah, he he's not known to lose very many cases. He's a damn good lawyer. He's an incredible litigator. If if you are in trouble and you need help, that's the guy you want. Now, whether you can afford him or not is another question, but that's the guy. He's doing this one pro bono because, and I yes. look, Lauren Greenspawn never met a camera he didn't like. That yes. is not distracting from the fact that he is probably one of the best litigators in Canada. Yep. No question. It's not up for debate. He is that well, good. Well, not... Not only the press, but it is a high-profile case that will set a very important precedent. Well, I'll give you a for instance of how well-known he's being part of history and how good he is at his job. You're familiar with Kevin Smith, the film director, actor, writer, producer. Yes. So a number of years ago, when he was doing a tour, and he they had a bus that they rented, the tour bus, and it got stopped at the border when they were coming into Canada at uh, Rock Vegas, I believe, or near that near that uh, entry point. Yep. They were arrested for trafficking. He's like, what? It's because they found traces of what was then an illegal substance in Canada, cannabis. Went through the procedure. They, his, their, uh, um, uh, his, his, his manager immediately contacted who's the best lawyer. Uh, Lawrence Greenspan stepped up, got them off scot-free because it was like, no, this was in there before. They knew coming into Canada, you don't bring the product across the border. What are you out of your minds? He's not a stupid man. So Lawrence Greenspawn got him off, got, got their whole team off. And he talked about it in one of his um, college, when he does his college tours, he talked about it and named Lawrence Greenspawn. He says, I'm forever grateful because otherwise I'd still be in a Canadian prison. And he says, don't get me wrong. I love Canada, but I don't want to be in prison. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I, I'll, I'll be right back. All right. Also on the legal front, since we're talking about uh, these type of issues, uh, in London, Ontario, the person who um, drove their truck off the street and onto a sidewalk and took out an entire Muslim family, except for one child, um, the judge ruled that those murders were terrorism. So for the first time in Canada, I believe that 
I think it's for the first time in Canada, an incident of white nationalist violence was ruled to be terrorism. It's about damn time. It's about damn time that the legal system recognizes that white nationalists can be terrorists Mm -hmm. too. He took out an entire family, except for one child, when he drove his truck on the sidewalk in London, Ontario. That's an important, important landmark decision. Another thing that happened also with a convoy too is uh, the news came out that Ottawa Bylaw and Regulatory Services says that Ottawa police told bylaw officers not to issue tickets during the February 7th Freedom Convoy demonstrations because of, quote, safety concerns and the risk of escalation. And um, to me, that's a very curious approach to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Don't enforce the law because the perps may get testy and break more laws? Seems to me that that's all the more reason to issue the tickets than not, because shouldn't we be deterring that type of behavior? One would think. By letting people know that if you're going to engage in it, it is going to be very, 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 very expensive for you. Isn't that the message we should be sending? Instead of sending the message, Well, if there are a lot of you, or if you say that if we enforce the law, we're just going to uh, get more violent and more destructive, so therefore you better not enforce the law. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's, it's, yeah. It's completely counter. Why are we doing this? And, um, uh, Douglas Judson, the lawyer that we had on the, the show mm-hmm. during the Christmas break, because he was the one that brought the case that uh, said that, uh, at least in Ontario, people who call people random, randomly call people groomers online can't use that as a defense, can't say, hey, I was only uh, exercising my free speech. That's, that's no longer brown, grounds for that. I actually saw my uh, saw the tweet and responded with this. <laughs> it's the cartoon of the Family Guy. Yeah. It's like Peter dressed it up, and a policeman has got a chart with colors from white to black, and the pale ones say okay, and the darker ones say not okay. That literally seems to be what Ottawa police services yeah. used to put that out, that directive. Don't find them because it may lead to escalation. Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. Are you kidding me? So in other words, if you're white enough, or if you threaten to be violent enough, if someone imposes minimum consequences, then you get a free pass. Is that really the precedent we want to be establishing? Is it? No. More heads need to roll. Yeah. There is something really, really wrong at Ottawa Police Services. You think? It's the whole, well, uh, we were worried about their safety. So guys with guys and gals with guns and body armor were worried about their safety against. And defense training and takedown training. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's now I can understand it when there's one police officer and there's 2000 people. Yeah. Don't be stupid. There, there might've been, might've been a hundred of them. Maybe. I don't even think there was that many at that place in time. Come on, man. 
Seriously. Well, because of the reporting Luc Lebrun did on that story, when that happened, the city is investigating the police services board. The city is going to launch an investigation and look into it. It's like, why did you do that? Why did you let that happen again? Right? This is not a good precedent. And I, uh, friends of mine are police officers here in this city. And I know that they are, are unbelievably frustrated with this situation. They're just like this. Actually, a, one of my buddies is, he's going to retire soon because, well, he's, he's got his 35 years in. So he's kind of like, yeah, I'm calling it quits soon because I cannot, I can't be a party to this anymore. I'm done. He, during, during the occupation, he was ready to just walk away at that point. He was so frustrated. He goes, I can't do my job. They won't let me do my job. And the last thing I want to mention before we go is um, I did take the time to watch the long 15-minute video with um, Dina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were certain things I didn't understand when I was commenting before that I understand more now. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think anything ultimately changes for me mm -hmm. in a sense and here's the thing is that that video does provide some context for what happened on that day it's true but i also watched other videos in the past because somebody's told me to go to karima's feed and go to other feeds right even the context of that day has context that comes from the past. And all of us have pasts. And a lot of people, because like you mentioned, she's counter-protesting the right cause, but maybe her tactics, a little questionable. And it's something I say on the show, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. So after watching all this video, there's some pro tips for counter-protesting, no matter what side of a protest you're on, that I think people should probably be aware of. One, in any given new incident, regardless of the history that parties may have with each other, the first to put hands on another, other than in proportional or reasonable self-defense, is in the wrong. So if somebody does something to you yesterday and it doesn't get caught and then you show up today mm -hmm. say, yesterday you did this to me so I'm going to be the first to lay hands on you, you're wrong today. The first to lay hands is in the wrong. Putting hands in response on someone who has put hands on you first with disproportionate, unreasonable, or escalatory force or zeal is also wrong. If somebody slaps you across the face, you don't have the right to go get a gun and shoot them down. No. You have the right to slap them across the face back. A reasonable force. Two wrongs don't make right. Putting hands on someone as a result of verbal provocations is wrong. Yes, words hurt. But words do not make physical contact. Somebody calling you whatever or saying whatever about you does not give you the right to put your hands on them. It's not justified. Responding to verbal provocations by entering one's personal space to respond in kind is unwise and increases the odds of hands being used eventually. So if one must respond, physical distance is your friend. Somebody calls you something, don't get right up in their face and start arguing with them mm -hmm. because that's an escalation and it goes up and it goes up. And it doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. Five, it is not at all necessary to be within two to three feet of another person in order to counter protest effectively. Could have done it across Streets the street. Streets have two sides for a reason. I just said that the other day. Stand across the street and yell at them all you want getting in their face is only going to escalate things and make it worse and it doesn't help your cause 
There is no constitutional right to not be offended even when people are trying their damn best to be offensive. Yeah. You can't be protected from that. Sorry. It's just how it is. It is not at all necessary to swing at every pitch or provocation. Somebody said this about me. Well, I have to say something. No, you don't. No, you can you can ignore it and walk away. And and you know, as I've learned over the last few years, sometimes that's the best way to do it. Just ignore it. And then people will call you out, you're you're a coward. Because I'm ignoring you, I'm a coward. No, I just don't want to engage with you because you're not worth my time. Exactly. Accidentally on purpose, making contact with others is wrong. Using accidentally as plausible deniability is always an unwise course of action. And in that video, we saw a guy being referred to as bebop guy. Mm -hmm. Boop, 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 boop. Like this, doing a whole bunch of things and then turning around and boom, his pack sack hit her. He says, oh, I didn't hit you with my pack sack. I'm like, you know what you did. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, accidentally on purpose is unwise. It's escalatory, but accidentally on purpose mm -hmm. does not give you a right. As I've said time and time again, in I don't know this person. We've never met. I have no idea what they're like as a human being. I have yep. seen them be a purposeful agitator, maybe fighting for the right cause, but I disagree with the method in which they're doing it. Yep. And I'm allowed to have that disagreement. Hey, I had that. I had that about Black Rights, uh, Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter, when they held up the Pride Parade mm -hmm. and released a smoke bomb. Like, Victor Rosa, you're siding with the oppressor. It's like you know they're protesting this. Yes, I understand what they're protesting. I support their cause. I didn't support that tactic. Right. Oh well, if you support the cause, you have to support all the tactics. No, I don't actually. You know, Karima takes a lot of heat, <clears throat> and undeservedly so, because she's simply commenting on what is happening. Well, you're taking the side. No, she's a lawyer, a litigator. She knows how things work. She simply is commenting on what she's reporting on what's being, what's happening, what's taking place. And I'll go, I'll go to bat for Karima, because I know who she is as a person. Yeah. Another point. The fact that one's protest or counter protest may be for a truly noble and honorable cause never confers additional special rights. Mm, indeed. I'm fighting for a good cause, so I have the right to put my hands on the. No, you don't. You don't. Remember, as I mentioned, the it, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it rule always applies. The nobility of one's cause did not, does not magically make acceptable all tactics used in furtherance of it. That's where the Tamara Leach goes around and says, I'm being persecuted for my beliefs. No, you're not being persecuted for your beliefs. You're, persecuted. you're being persecuted or prosecuted, not persecuted, for what you did in furtherance of those beliefs. Your actions. You can have all the beliefs you want. It's when you try to push your beliefs, what you choose to do, and these are choices, in order to push those beliefs forward. That's what will get you in trouble. These pro tips apply to all people, no exceptions. In all cases, no exceptions. Whatever side they're on, no exceptions. Given that our charter and courts recognize that political speech is granted the highest level of protection because of its essential role in democratic life, when you bring it, bring your passion, not your fire. Like to repeat that. If you're counter protesting something, bring your passion, but do not bring your fire. Keep your hands to yourself. Keep your megaphones to yourself. Don't try to grab other people's signs. If someone calls you names, I'll be right back. I gotta take care of something here. Kind. Don't get in someone's face. Bring your passion, but don't bring your fire. 
Nobody enjoys being assaulted and abused. Nobody enjoys it. But you also, you also can't be going up to people seeking to provoke an episode that can lead to abuse and claim that you're blameless. Everybody has personal responsibility for their choices. And somebody said, you know what? You should have Dina on your show. And that's probably something that's not going to happen. Because though I've seen video of that day, and if I look at that day in isolation, yeah, someone bumped into her first. But we also see her on camera saying, put that camera on me and watch me kick the, or, you know, beat the shit out of someone or something of that, that like. She's trying to grab people's signs. And I've seen other videos where people have taken stuff off her. But I've also seen her hit people in the face with her megaphone. I've seen her sit on a corner and taunt people trying to provoke them to get mad, calling them names, and doing all the stuff. <sighs> these are the tactics you want to use if you believe that your cause is so noble or these people are so terrible that you are entitled to do all these stuff and that it's justifiable. Those are choices. But they are choices that are also stir the pot. They are escalations. It's not just standing there going, I disagree with your point of view. This is how I think it should be. If you're going fishing, if you're putting out bait, if you are entering people's personal space, if you are arguing with them nose to nose, If someone's filming you and you start talking to the camera and start talking smack or shit about them, there are other choices you could have made in that moment. When the camera's on you, you could be talking about your cause and why it is you believe in it and why it is you're here. Rather than making comments about the person holding the camera. There are choices, there are decision points every step of the way. You have to make wise choices. You have to make choices that will actually further your cause. You have to make choices that will gain you allies, and that will gain you respect. It's the harder path. It doesn't get as many clicks. It doesn't get you as much publicity. It doesn't earn you fans among the people who are the most militant. But if you're going to be an activist or an advocate, there are certain things that you cannot permit yourself to do. If you are making sure that you are putting the cause first. The moment you start losing sight of putting the cause first, or it becomes about, these people did this to me last time, so now I'm going to give them back as good as they got, you're losing the plot, and you're not helping your cause. You might get a win in the moment when Black Lives Matter held up the Pride Parade and the smoke bomb went off. They made the news. They got a lot of publicity. They got a lot of attention to their cause. A lot of people thought that that was the win. 
But Black Lives Matter Toronto also lost a lot of allies within the gay community on that day. They lost them forever. Because they took Pride Day. They and they took a Pride Day, the first Pride Day that the Prime Minister of Canada, mm -hmm. any Prime Minister of Canada, participated in, in the year that there was the Pulse nightclub shooting. So not only were we celebrating the fact that we were actually being recognized as full humans by a Prime Minister of the day, but we were also in a bit of mourning. And they hijacked it and they made it about themselves. They came into our home and were not good guests. Mm -hmm. Now, our community had a lot to make up for because Pride Toronto hadn't been doing as good a job over the past years of being racially diverse and representative. And that was our bad. But we were trying to correct that by putting them at the head of the parade. And I took a lot of flack for pointing out that that was not the right time to do that. So if your goal was to get media attention and whatnot, you did. But if your goal was to build allyships that would last for the long term, that didn't happen on that day. And in this case, while you may be standing up, in the case here of the, what's the protest on the Hill and what Dina is doing, while you may be standing up for causes that are good and for people that deserve to be standed up, stood up for, if your behavior in doing that is not beyond reproach, or if you use the fact that you were provoked or that someone touched you or made contact with you as a reason or as license to not bring out the best side of yourself. You're not as effective as you can be and you are going to lose allies. You'll gain some fans. But you'll lose a lot of allies as well. There are people that will not want to be associated with you. You can't just allow yourself all permissions to do everything because your cause is noble. It just doesn't work that way. And if you're on the other side and you've had something wrong done to you by a group of people, Every time the subject of those group of people come up, using it as an invitation to go back and talk smack about those people, it's also probably not a wise idea. Again, you don't have to swing at every pitch. It's not necessary. Not every opportunity is an invitation. So counter-protesting, it's very important. But don't put yourself in situations that are dangerous, that can cause harm to come, happen to you. And unless you are strictly in a position of self-defense, your hands should not be on any other's person. And you probably shouldn't be taunting and you probably shouldn't be cursing. It, it doesn't help the cause, ultimately. You might win the battle on the day, but you don't win the war and you don't gain ground. Like, what happened that day on the hill was wrong. When I saw the video at first, I thought, okay, he's trying to break up a fight. He took her, he t removed her from the situation. It's like, no, there was stuff that happened before. And this guy also has a past. So, but nobody on that day was right. 
nobody on that day was right. When she got bopped by that bag, by Bebop guy, responding by trying to grab people's signs, say, put the camera on me, I'm going to resort to violence and I want you to catch this on video. Ding, that's my stop, that's where I get off. I don't care what your cause is. I don't care how good a person you are in your normal life. That's my stop. That's where I get off. I, I can't support you. There are other choices. There are other ways you can react in that situation. I just, I, I can't. So when people say you should have her on, would I meet with her? at a pub or one-on-one -on, -one on the street to have a conversation with her? Yeah, of course. But would I make my platform available? Uh, I'm not sure I want to promote that. I don't want to promote my cause is noble, so everything I do is okay. It's one of the values I cherish most is temperance. There is an appropriate level of response, an appropriate level of heat that you can bring into a situation, but not more. The minute you start losing mastery over yourself, you've lost the game. There was a moment in the past where Yves-François Blanchet made a racist comment against me. And I got invited onto Charles Adler's show at the time to talk about it. And a couple of times Charles Adler asked me the question, that could have given me an opportunity to make a comment about Blanchette with regard to his political beliefs on separation or that type of stuff, to go, in, go down the path. And while I could have done that, I resisted that. Instead of ascribing to him intent, saying, I don't know what's in his mind, all I can talk about is the behavior on that day. And I kept it about the behavior on that day. And that earned me, at the end of the interview, the respect and the admiration of Mr. Adler. Because I didn't go there. The pitch was made. The opportunity was there. And I don't think he asked it to me to bait me. I think he asked it to me for me to see what kind of person I was. But I had a choice in that moment. I could have gone for the jugular and made the emotional statement or made the hyperbolic statement. But I chose to keep mastery over myself, even though I had been, racist stuff had been said to me. <laughs> and I actually got accused of being a racist by Yves François Blanchet. And even though I have this history with this man, I can still, on this show, talk about him when he does something good, and does something good, and when he does something bad. And, like this. and I do say I have history with him. But I don't let that history make me unable to recognize when he's done something of value. I keep mastery over myself. So would I talk to her one-on-one -on -one and find out what she's about? Yes. Would I invite her on the show and give her a platform? <sighs> I'm sorry. I, I just can't do that. I just can't do that. I can't support the tactics. I just can't. 
All right. Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? Yes, we do, sir. I'm just sorry wrapping up a dozen things because I'm in a meeting right now. So I'm just no talking worry. in and out. All right, Kits and Cubs, uh, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring. That word of mouth is priceless. So please, 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 please tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you do not want to miss an episode, please, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. If you scan that QR code under my chin, you can go to our pod page site. And if you're listening, it's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you subscribe there, when there's something fresh off the bandwidth, you do not have to miss it. It will come directly to you. And if you'd like to support us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine and go to our YouTube channel, True North Eager Beaver Media, and click like, share, and subscribe there. That helps us out a lot. And again, if you like this week's content or this month's content and you would like to support us in another way, that QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head brings you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com, slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you will find the Eager Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund, where our friends Giddis, Chocolate, Coffee, and Caesar are waiting there to help us produce Monday's show. So if you got a couple of tooties lying around and you'd like to put it in their little piggy bank there, we would really, really appreciate it. If you want to write to us, truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com or leave a comment on the YouTube, leave a comment on our Twitter feed or on our Facebook page. We read everything. We can't always get back to you, but we do read absolutely everything and we are uh, we take everything in to try to make the show better. Um, because democracy is something that you do, please write those letters. They're very important. And uh, also, uh, I'd like to mention this, um, check out uh, an episode of The O Show because uh, Kit Angela uh, has been on it talking about uh, certain things. Uh, I don't remember, I think it was about the homelessness issue specifically that she was talking about, but uh, check it out. It's real, really worth it. And um, this is going on here, so this is something you may want to support Kits and Cubs. Um, in Hamilton... Uh, there is an organize, uh, an event called Camp for Kindness 2 where um, a group of people will be camping out uh, for four days. Kit Angela is uh, leading that initiative in order to uh, raise some awareness uh, with regard to homelessness uh, prior to a major city council decision, I believe, that is planned for Wednesday. And uh, as you can see, uh, we have definitely uh, lent our support to that. She asked if we would, and uh, we most definitely will because she is doing very, very, very good work. Very, very quickly. It's about like two, three days notice, and they are looking for supplies. So if you're in the Hamilton area, if you've got like coffee and a whole bunch of stuff like that, but uh, go to the Camp for Kindness uh, 2 page on Facebook uh, or look up uh, Angela's uh, Twitter feed Angela Voss 7 and um, see what help they need. Uh, and if you can't help, please do because it's a good cause. Remember, homelessness is a policy choice. So let's encourage our elected officials to make better choices. Okay. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind to and gentle with yourself and have a fabulous weekend. Mr. Grizzly, do you have words of wisdom, please? I cannot hear you, sir. I still can't hear you. All right. I don't know if the kits can hear Mr. Grizzly or not, but I, I hear no sound. So we'll assume that Mr. Grizzly said something very, very wise as usual. Oh, there you are. Okay. I don't know what happened there. It was weird. Um, apologies. Weird stuff. It's been a roller coaster of a show, a roller coaster of a morning. We discussed a million things under the sun, and I imagine there are probably a few people that are feeling a little bit of uh, anxiety from this. I was monitoring the chat. I'm still in a meeting. I'm still working, but I was monitoring the chat, and there was a lot of uh, anxious moments for me because when I see things that are going on, it's like, oh, we don't want anybody to be hurt or harmed on this show ever. 
Mm-hmm. So we just, you know, I want to express that if you're having a difficult time, if today was troublesome, this is self-serving. I'm going to admit it. It is self-serving. But here's the thing. It's self-serving in the gentlest, kindest way I can think of. I want you to um, go to my YouTube page, Holly's World 2005, where you can uh, where you can access some our channel, which will give you uh, peace of mind if need be. I'm going to put a link in the chat here. Again, like I said, I understand this is self-serving, but this might help you today if you need a few moments of peace of mind uh, and some calming uh, words of encouragement and how to deal with mental health issues. So please, if you're having a difficult day, if you need to take a break, take a few minutes, go ahead, by all means, click the link in the chat. You can go to my ASMR channel where it will be nothing but kindness and warmth and everyone is welcome. And that's kind of all I've got to say today. All right. Find some kindness today. Be good to yourselves. Mr. Grizzly, roll the credits. Uh, I don't have anything for the Easter egg and I have a bus to catch in 44 minutes. So um, unless you have something for an Easter egg. I do have something um, quickly. Okay. We'll be back in a minute. All right. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients Roll your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. So here's something I want to share with you. Uh, we're going to pivot to Doug Ford for a couple of seconds here. While I show you the a tweet from Richard Southern from Richard at City News. Ooh, I, like I, will, him. I will read this to you. New, the government releases the partially redacted business case for Service Ontario to Global News. It shows Staples will get $8.2 million, $8.29 million over three years to run nine locations compared to the $3.66 million a year it costs the government to run with independent owners. Yep. Just paying the middleman. Yeah. If that move is not a success and foot traffic doesn't increase, though it could also see the government pay more for fewer visits. The total payment of $8.29 million is set for the three years of the pilot plus setup costs. <sighs> I'm getting tired of that guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All righty. Have yourselves a great weekend. I'll see you. Bye.